Hey, this is Josh. Yeah, we're all set. Okay, thanks so much. Uh, good evening, everyone. It is 7.02 p.m. It is May 4th, is now joining. 2020, and I'm calling to order the monthly meeting of the Concord School Board. Is now exiting. Um, our first agenda item is the emergency meeting statement and the call to order. Um, I'll make it as brief as I can. Um, as president of the Concord School Board, I find that due to the state of emergency declared by the governor as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic and in accordance with the governor's emergency order number 12, pursuant to executive order 2020-04, this public body is authorized to meet electronically. The business we intend to conduct today is necessary due to the need to continue moving forward with the regular monthly meeting of the board. This will include taking public comment as noted on the posted agenda by unmuting phone lines one by one during the public comment period. It would be helpful for those wishing to comment to indicate their names in the comment function of Microsoft Teams so we may call on you more easily. In accordance with policy number 136, public comments are limited to five minutes per person to allow all interested parties to comment. And we also encourage the submission of comments via email at concordinfo at sau8.org. Please note that there is no physical location to observe and listen contemporaneously to this meeting. However, in accordance with the governor's emergency order, we are providing public access to the meeting by telephone and also via Microsoft Teams and a broadcast on CCTV. All members of the board have the ability to con communicate contemporaneously and the public can contemporaneously listen and if necessary, participate in the meeting by dialing 925-391-1169 and the conference ID is 669-397-408-POUND. They can also click on the link on the SAU8 website um, they can watch on YouTube, Concord NH TV, or Comcast Channel 6, um, and a recording of the meeting will also be posted on CCTV's website. We did give notice to the public of the necessary information for accessing the meeting. Um, this was all posted on the board's website at sau8.org more than 24 hours prior to the meeting, and it's highlighted at the top of the website. If any member of the public is having trouble with access during the meeting, they should call us at 603-513-9008. And in the event that we have unresolvable problems with public access, we will adjourn the meeting and reschedule it. So I'm gonna start by taking a roll call of board members and others participating. Um, since all members are participating remotely, any votes will be taken via roll call vote. So as members, when you state your presence, please also state whether anyone is in the room with you as this is required under our right to know law. Um, and please do mute your, your microphone when you're not speaking and wait to be recognized. I will try and keep a close eye on people who are wanting to speak. Um, so Ms. Cannon, are you present? I am present and I am alone. I'm just having issues with my mute button. <laughs> well, we hear you loud and clear, so thank you. Uh, Mr. Croto, are you present? I am present and I am alone. Great, thank you. Mr. Fresh, are you present? I am present. I'm alone. I do have a request that you repeat the dial-in number uh, for people wanting to call in. Several people have sent me a text during that process, but you can do that at some point. Thank you. Oh, sure. I'd be happy to do that. Yep, thank you. Um, Ms. Higgins, are you present? I'm here, and I'm surrounded by all my closest friends, which means I'm by myself. <laughs> oh, Barb. <laughs> Glad you're here. Uh, Mr. Parker, are you present? Present and solo. Thank you. Ms. Poitier, are you yes. present? Yes, I'm here, and I'm alone. Thanks. Great, thank you. Uh, Mr. Richards, are you present? I am present. I'm alone in the room, and I can hear very well. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Mr. Richards. Um, Ms. Smith, are you present? I am here and I am alone. Great. Thank you so much. And I'm Jennifer Patterson. I am present and I am also alone in the room. And let me just, before I forget, um, Chuck had asked that I repeat the dial-in number. Um, 
and we certainly encourage folks to call in. It's 925-391-1169, and the conference ID is 669-397-4000. Pound. Um, so if there's someone who's watching this on CCTV and wants to participate, please do call in or you can always join on Microsoft Teams. Um, so I've gone through the board members who are present. Um, I think we have some district staff present. So Dr. Bass, maybe you can go through who's present um, just for purposes of recording the participants. Oh, let me actually, let me get the, we have the student members who are present too. So let me do that. Uh, so Ms. Richards, are you present? Yes, I'm present and no one's in the room. Great, thank you so much. Um, and Mr. Brown, are you present? Uh, yes, I'm present and I'm alone in the room. Great, thank you so much. Um, I forgot your last name, so I had to look at the screen. <laughs> um, I'm glad both of you could be here for this meeting, that's great. Um, okay, so I'll turn it to Dr. Bass, just for district staff who are participating. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So I believe, I can't see all the uh, faces in front of me, but I think I know who's here. So Jack Dunn, Business Administrator, Larry Prince, Director of Human Resources, uh, Donna Paley, Assistant Superintendent, Matt Cashman, Director of uh, Facilities and Grounds, and I believe I've got everybody. If anyone else is out there that I missed, please go ahead and chime in. I don't think Donna is here. It's, this is Lyndon speaking. Oh, Lyndon, thank you. Yeah, and Lyndon Jacket is here as well. And I thought I saw Paulette. Um, Paulette is here, but I don't see Donna on the list. Oh, Donna's here. Donna's here. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Donna, really? Yes, I am here. Thank you. Okay, <laughs> Thanks. Paulette's here too. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Paulette. Um, okay, did I miss anyone who is? here from the district. All right, so moving forward, and we will have some other guests, but we'll wait to introduce them when they sure. arrive. Um, so the next item is the approval of the agenda, and I have a motion to amend the agenda, and I will make it. Um, the amendment would be to add an item to talk about the eighth grade DC trip. Um, and some updates and possible board actions on that. So I will make an motion to add that as agenda item number nine after the negotiations committee report. Um, so is there a second to that motion? I'll second that motion. Okay, so Kenny and then Jim seconded it. And any discussion of the amendment? So all in favor of the agenda as amended, I guess I have to go through the roll call. So let me do that. Um, Ms. Cannon? Aye. Thank you, Ms. Cannon. Mr. Croto? Aye. Thank you, Mr. Croto. Uh, Mr. Crush? Aye. Thank you, Mr. Crush. Ms. Higgins? Aye. Thank you, Ms. Higgins. Uh, Mr. Parker? Aye. Thank you, Mr. Parker. Ms. Poignier? Aye. Thank you, Ms. Poignier. Mr. Richards? Aye. Thank you, Mr. Richards. Ms. Smith? Aye. Thank you, Ms. Smith. And the chair votes aye. So the amended agenda is approved. So next we have approval of board minutes. And I think I'll take them as a group. I'm just going to secret secretary. I'm just going to summarize them really briefly and then um, Barb, as the secretary, is moving into the role, or I guess moving back into the role of really taking the lead on the minutes, which is wonderful. For a while, I was having kind of a greater role than I would have wanted just because of, of all the emergency and legal aid stuff. So thank you, Barb, for that. And thank you, Linda, no for your work on them. Um, so here are the minutes that we've got. We've got the April 6th monthly meeting. We've got the April 2nd and April 6th public hearings on the budget. We have the April 13th vote on the budget and the staff contracts, renewals, 
We've got the April 15th meeting on the superintendent search. That was a non-public meeting, but we made the minutes of the meeting public because we wanted the public to understand kind of where we were with the process. That was a very preliminary conversation that we had with the candidates that were presented to the board by the screening committee. Um, so, so those minutes are, are from April 15th. Um, April 21st, we had a fully public meeting on the superintendent search process and how to potentially modify it in light of COVID-19. And then on April 23rd, we had a special meeting for scheduling. So I will look and see if anyone has comments, questions, or revisions of any of those minutes. Uh, yeah, didn't we have a negotiations committee meeting in there, a non-public? We did, but we don't have to keep minutes of that meeting because it's a non-meeting under RSA 91A. So we don't typically okay. have minutes for that. Okay, thank you. Yep, thank you. Any other questions, comments, anything else on the minutes? So seeing none, I will call the roll on approval of all of those sets of minutes. Um, Ms. Cannon? Can I Aye. get a second? Oh, sorry. sorry, I think Jenny, someone had to get a second to the motion. Oh, I didn't get a second. Thank you, Lyndon. Would I'll someone second like it. to second? <laughs> Thank you, Barb. So moved by Jenny, seconded by Barb. And now I will call the roll. Um, Ms. Cannon. And now I will say aye. Thank you, Ms. Cannon. Mr. Croto. Aye. Thank you, Mr. Curdo. Mr. Crush. Aye. Thank you, Mr. Crush. Ms. Higgins. Aye. Thank you, Ms. Higgins. Mr. Parker. Aye. Thank you, Mr. Parker. Ms. Poignier. Aye. Thank you, Ms. Poignier. Mr. Richards. Aye. Thank you, Mr. Richards. Ms. Smith. Aye. Thank you, Ms. Smith. And the chair votes aye. So those minutes are unanimously approved. Um, so next we move into recognitions and reports. And I will turn it over to, to Dr. Bass and to our student representatives first. But Dr. Bass, if you wanted to transition it, please go ahead. Uh, I, yeah, so why don't we hear from Gavin first and then we'll move into my stuff. I've got a lot of stuff here. We have a guest speaker and so forth. So let's go to Gavin and company first, all right? Okay. Okay. So, um, since schools were closed in March, there have been lots of work by CHS staff and students, as well as the district as a whole. So, after coming back from our April break, this is the student six week of remote learning. Um, while structure can vary slightly best on class format, it is typical that teachers will assign work ahead of time with due dates or weekly assignments to be due on the Friday of every week. Google Classroom is the main format with which teachers post assignments, as well as utilizing email and Google Meets to keep in contact with students. And school will officially end for students on June 4th. Because remote learning is something our Concord schools have never dealt with before in this way, communication between administration, staff, parents, and students is more important than ever. A survey was sent out to students mid-April with a different one previously sent to parents a few days prior seeking feedback on the remote learning experience. The student survey provided three, uh, 538 responses with a fairly even divide across all grades. Based on the feedback that was provided, CHS leadership has taken many positive steps in improving remote learning. So in this survey, many students expressed that they felt that the workload was too large due to the amount of schoolwork they were already receiving in each class, along with other individual obligations that each student faces during the time. This was responded to immediately with a memo going out to staff to suggest a workload decreased by 20%, as well as considering only requiring assignments that are necessary for student learning and evaluating student learning. The administration has also worked with curriculum facilitators to establish end of the year dates for new instruction. For seniors, this is the week of May 18th to the 22nd, and for underclassmen, this is the week of the 26th through the 29th of May. This allows for proper spacing of work and lesson planning for teachers, as well as to ensure time for recovery and reassessments if students um, find that necessary. 
Survey results also made it clear that the most prominent challenge experienced by students in this time of remote learning were social, emotional, and physical health concerns. As a response to this, guidance counselors are and have been reaching out to students who are at the most risk, such as those students with multiple weeks of unverified absences or pre-existing social, emotional, and physical health concerns prior to remote learning. Guidance counselors are also offering office hours and availability by appointment to meet with parents and students to help as well. In addition to this, many teachers and guidance counselors are creating pre-recorded mindfulness activities to further help their students. Additionally, CHS has make, made sure to do its best to stay in contact with students, especially those who have not been actively participating in remote learning. UNV lists are broken down by commons, allowing counselors, administrative assistants, program assistants, and administrators to reach out to students and families in a variety of ways, such as phone calls, Google Meets, letters, emails, and pre-recorded messages. Teachers have also established office hours and are setting more time for one-on-one -on -one or small group discussions using similar platforms. Students have also sought more live instruction through Google Meet. Many teachers have increased video meets, pre-recorded lessons, availability for phone conversations, and additional hours for Google Chats. However, while it is essential that students are considered, so are that of our teachers and staff. This has been noted when originally structuring online learning and additional adjustments to instruction based on survey feedback. So in many areas, students have still been able to come together, especially on online platforms. A CHS Instagram was created to bring updates to students, as well as a platform for things such as CHS Live, our morning video announcements. A virtual yearbook page was also created, as well as a senior class, Where Are You Going? CHS page, allowing seniors to connect to peers and show their support as they make their college decisions. The junior class has also done many things, such as a project for Teacher Appreciation Week, and a junior class page with senior class interviews, giving juniors and underclassmen advice for seniors and other general explanations about where they are going after high school and their work leading up to that. Other organizations, organizations such as SAAD, Student Alliance Against Disease, have organized a thank you video to healthcare workers with student submissions. Lastly, the school has taken additional steps for students to feel connected and support each other in this difficult time, such as creating signs to be administered to all CHS seniors and making new CHS apparel available to purchase. Now in May, there is one month remaining of this school year. Going forward, students are to continue with the remaining weeks of online learning, hopefully continuing to utilize all of the resources they have available and staying connected with each other and the staff the best that they can. We wanted to extend our gratitude to the school district for making the best of remote learning. Obviously, many students are disappointed we don't get a typical school year, but we know this is new territory for everyone and a lot is out of our control. We really appreciate all of the work that is being and all the support that is being extended and work all of the staff is doing to make the situation the best that it can be. Well, thank you. It's wonderful to have you back again. I'm really glad that you were able to come and report and it's fascinating to hear from the student perspective how it's going. I'm really glad that we had those surveys and I'm glad that the administration was able to rapidly implement responses to it. It sounds like that was, you know, really, really a helpful process. Yeah, um, they had a lot of great immediate responses to that. Do other board members have questions for the student representatives? Well, thank you again. Welcome back and Good luck with the last month of the school year. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, actually, that Thank serves, you. it serves as a really nice segue into where I was going on the whole issue of remote learning. And I got a lot of things to say, so I'm going to kind of skip around here. And I got people who are in the waiting line, so I don't want to take too much time on this. But I do want to say that the remote learning has come under um, scrutiny, if you will, by the State Department of Education. And we have been cited on a number of occasions about how good the remote learning is going here in Concord K-12. I mean, we actually were singled out uh, in terms of what we've been able to accomplish over the course of these last month, month and a half or so. So kudos to all the administrators, all the teachers. And I must say, parents as well, 
Uh, great message for our parents because, and Paulette will certainly attest to this, we've been getting so many emails from parents talking about, oh, I never realized what teachers had to do, and now that I'm working with my son or my daughter, I, I understand, and some of these, these, these um, activities are so interesting, and, you know, I was able to spin it this way or spin it that way, so it's been a creative thing for us, and so we've been hearing a lot from the parents about how they've enjoyed, to a certain degree anyway, um, this whole remote learning experience, so that, that's been really helpful. And uh, as I say, I'll, I'll get more into that later on, um, but I have some guests that are waiting here. And so um, speaking of this remote learning, um, we had three, cho three students that we um, highlighted in a TV show recently. Charlie Dustin, who is a, a fifth grade student at Beaver Meadow, came up with a brilliant idea. He has a newspaper that he developed. It's electronic. And so now the whole school gets to see all the information and news that he's able to generate. And it started out just being a simple thing that he wanted to do for his friends, and it ballooned into this, you know, school community project. And so now everyone is jumping in saying, what's the latest article and what's the latest news? But that was all entrepreneurial on his part. Obviously, his parents helped out, the school helped out, but it was Charlie's idea. And again, that's what I'm trying to get at here. The student initiative and the student um, ideation here is really terrific. And then we go to the middle school, and we have Miss Courtney Renault. Courtney decided that she was concerned about her grandparents, so she made some masks for them because when they went to the grocery store, she didn't want them to be in contact with people who might have the, uh, the virus. And then as she made the mask, people started saying, oh, gee, Courtney, those are really neat. Could you make one for me? Well, as you can guess, it ballooned, and so now the whole school has them, and she actually makes them herself. Her father taught her how to sew. She's, she's made these masks. She's made 179 so far, and the lists keep coming in. So there's another entrepreneurial spirit on the part of our students trying to make the, the best of the situation. And as you can see, in many respects, it has very little to do with education. It's all about community. It's all about connection and helping out those that might be in a less favorable position than you are, which I think is just wonderful. And lastly, we're going to get to Grennan Gurney, who was a senior, a, kind of a rising senior at the high school. And I would have loved to have been able to present his uh, project that he's doing, but it's beyond my ability. So I asked Grennan to come forward, and he can tell you himself what he's doing and why he's doing it. Go ahead, Grennan. Oh, he's still there. Grennan, are you still there? Grennan, you might need to unmute your microphone. Did we lose him? Yeah. Grennan, you can type something in the chat part to let us know. Oh, can I got you... Here he is. Here he is. Grennan, were you able to hear me? Yeah. He's got to unmute. He's got to unmute. Still can't hear you. Lyndon, can you help him out? Um, I just sent him a, a message on chat. Yeah. Uh, in the chat that's part of Teams. Grennan, if you can hover your cursor around the screen, you'll see a menu. And there's one that looks like a little chat thing. You need to unmute your microphone. Can you thumbs up if you can hear me? Oh, no, I can't hear you. Greta, can you hear me? Put thumbs up if you can hear me. In the chat, he says he's leaving and coming back because it's oh, not all right. working. He, has, he can hear me. He can hear me, though. Okay. All right, he's going to come back. All right. Uh, in any event, so as Grennan's preparing, let me just give you a little bit of background. Um, uh, what? Oh, who's this? Oh, here he comes. He's coming back. All right, Grennan. Go ahead, Grennan. Still can't hear you. Are you muted? Hi, Larry. <laughs> uh, folks, I'm sorry for this. I don't know what the, the problem is. Um, You may need to do what I did, which is uh, join, uh, but then also call in on his phone. So it looks like he's going to try to call in on his phone so he can speak. All right. So let's wait for a second and see if he okay. comes. Okay. 
Yeah. Dr. Bass, while we're yes. waiting, yes, I will point out too, and I'm going to hold it up for the camera right here, that uh, the Title Force Robotics team also oh, made a lot of masks that they distributed to the first responders. Yep. Uh, the sense of community is clearly pervasive throughout all of our students, and um, they did an outstanding job. I just want to give them some credit. There's a lot of examples of how the uh, high school students are involved in the community as well as their remote learning classes. Yeah, great point, Jim. I'm glad you raised that. I'd forgotten about that. I think Jen Spidell had sent me a note about that. You're absolutely right. Uh, that That's just great. Again, I, it, it just speaks to the, I mean, it's more than just altruism. It's just the sense of, of community that I think, you know, the kids feel. And they just want to be a part of it and they want to help out. And you can't ask for more of that. I mean, to me, that means so much more than, you know, how well you did on the math test or how well you did on the, the project, you know? So Jen, oh, this is Barbara. Is so Jen Spidell is my neighbor. And uh, her, her daughter Rosie, yeah, her daughter Rosie was good friends with Molly. Yeah. Um, so when, when we got our first round of masks down here, she put in a Molly bead, uh, detail on there. Jenny, yours are in the mail. So yeah. she's made over 100 Molly B masks for all of Molly's loved ones. And, That's great. They, you know, they just, they just are doing amazing things. That's terrific. Let's see if Grennan might be back on the call. Grennan, can you hear yeah, us now? I think, it's, I think it's working now. Great. Hey, okay. Grennan, I gave you this beautiful lead-in, so. <laughs> oh, yeah. Talk to us about Sorry about that. It's, it's ironic that my project is so heavily in uh, technology, and yet I just struggled with that. But um, as Dr. Bass said, mine's a little bit more complex. Uh, it still has that altruistic nature. I, I, I came across, I was, I was starting throughout the uh, remote learning to try and find different things to stay connected and stay interested in what I'm doing, especially in the realm of computer science. And something that I, I experienced when I was an incoming freshman was the uh, anxiety and stress related to picking your classes. So I decided to kind of channel this new information I was learning about computer science and artificial intelligence into a project that would make uh, incoming freshmen less stressed, a little bit less anxious when picking their classes. Uh, and then I ended up expanding this project to encompass the entirety of the school rather than just the freshmen. Yeah. So it will help uh, as a student moves through high school, it will recommend classes based on their academic prowess and their interests. So this will allow the student to to plan out a plan out a kind of track in which they can put different classes depending on where they want to go after school, whether it be college, straight into the workforce, maybe a trade school, something of the sort. Mm -hmm. So it's something for everyone. And the other thing that makes it interesting is that its recommendation is based on social trends and the use themselves rather than just data. Right. So it's a little bit more personal. Uh, and I really wanted this to be less of a, even though it is machine learning and artificial intelligence, I wanted it to be less of a machine making decisions and instead be something that was more similar to something that you would know as a person, kind of like a guidance counselor almost. Yeah, yeah. So, Brennan, uh, what was the analogy you used? Like, pretend Mr. Richards is in, in my screen right now. So, pretend Mr. Richards and I are, you know, sophomores at the school and we're going going into our junior year. I mean, give us an analogy of how this would work for us. Uh, and now the one I rec uh, the one I said to you was with Netflix. So, yes. say you want to find something to watch on Netflix. Personally, I like comedy movies. Right. So. Netflix is more likely to rec recommend me movies that are comedy, comedic in nature. Right. And say you are very like me in many aspects. Mm -hmm. What Netflix would be able to do is say, well, you know what? Brennan, Brennan has liked these movies that have a comedy aspects. And right. we know that Dr. Bass is much like Brennan or Dr. Bass is much like Mr. Richards. Right. So we're going to recommend the movies that Grennan has seen that Dr. Bass and Mr. Richards haven't, uh, right. and vice versa. Right. So that's kind of how it works, and that's how it's more about the people rather than the product. That's terrific. I mean, again, so like for the example for Mr. Richards and I, it gives us sort of a, a bird's eye view of, you know, things that we probably would really like to do and may not have known about, and so it's giving us a, an indication of things that would, would – 
probably suit us uh, best as we move forward. Yeah, yeah. And that's the, uh, that's the other thing is, while the school does a really great job with uh, their, their course handbook, it is nice to have something that seems a little bit more personal. I've actually talked to Mr. Richard's youngest son about the <laughs> different classes that are coming yeah. up, uh, the many new ones even this year. So there's a lot of stuff that people might miss. And I'm hoping this would give them a more a broader picture. Well, Grennan, I I think probably one of the really great things is that your program will prompt a conversation and get me to ask questions or get my youngest son to ask questions that will um, lead to me finding out more information than I would normally had from just reading a handbook. That's the hope. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent point, Mr. Richards. Thank you. Uh, other comments from board members or other folks that are on the on the on the call? Well, again, Grenon, thank you so much. I mean, this is great. And again, I just wanted to highlight, you know, some of the entrepreneurial things that our kids are doing, and it's really exciting, and it's just wonderful to to be a part of this. And I think, like Mr. Richards was saying, it's it's something that everybody can gain from. Uh, it's not just a certain group, and so this is terrific. And I think I, I like that approach. Thank you. Great, thank you very great much. job, Brennan. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks thank for you. coming and telling us about this. It's great. Of course, I'm happy to. Thanks again, Grennan. Okay, moving along, as I said, I have a, a lot of things here. I do want to go to another guest that we have who's been waiting patiently. Uh, speaking of entrepreneurial, he's very entrepreneurial himself. Uh, so I want to introduce Nate Levinson. Nate Levinson had a chance to meet with Jenny, Gina, myself, and a few others from the central office to talk about, you know, if we're going to look at student services as a general uh, uh, issue within our school system, um, how can we recalibrate all that? How can we look at that in a way and say, okay, what works well, what doesn't work well, and, and what is it we're really trying to do here? What's the big picture? Uh, we came away very impressed with what Nate and his team um, had to offer, and that's why we felt it was important to have him come before the board and make a presentation. I know Ms. Patterson has sent you all uh, the, uh, the tenets of that presentation, and so, um, Nate, I would like to introduce you, and you can uh, take it from there, and then we'll see how we do. Great. Good evening. Uh, most importantly, can folks see me and hear me? I see you and I hear you. Hopefully everyone else can That's see you. already at least 50% successful. Thank you very much. Um, again, my name is Nate Levinson. I'm managing director uh, with the district management group. Uh, very quickly, by way of background, I've been a consultant to public schools now for about 11 years. I've worked with almost 200 school districts. 28 states, uh, the vast majority of them. Um, I work around supports for struggling students. Uh, prior to that, I've been a school superintendent. I've spent six years on a school board, so I have great admiration for all of you. Um, and what I wanted to do tonight was spend about 10 minutes giving you an overview of our thinking and our approach uh, to this broad question of how do you serve students who struggle even better this is a continuous improvement mindset, recognizing that you do many things well already, uh, but the good never rest. Um, but to really to think about this question of how do you serve students who struggle well, but also, and equally as importantly, make the work more Got sustainable work. for your staff, because we do have a, a growing challenge across the country that special educators and even general educators are stressed, and that was before we shut down every school in the country. And lastly, how do you do all of those things within the financial strength? Uh, so with your permission, I was going to spend about 10 minutes walking you through a, a handful of slides and then um, take your questions uh, from there. Well, we're right here. Possible? So, yep, I think someone may have their mic unmuted. You just want to check and make sure your mics are off. But yeah, please go ahead. Right now, we'll try the second biggest challenge, muted. sharing my screen. Let's see Brennan. that Shut. one works. Is now exiting. <coughs> Let's see if I can get... Alrighty, uh, you should be seeing a very large uh, white slide that says expanding and strengthening best practice supports for students who struggle. Uh, I see it. That looks yep. good. Alrighty, I'm ready to go home now because this is our <laughs> success. Um, again, most important framing Everything that the district management group does and everything we would want to do as your partner has to meet three goals. 
one, it's got to be great for kids. Obviously, it's why you get up in the morning. It's why we get up in the morning. It's why you're here late tonight. Um, but as important as that is, that's excellent but not sufficient. It's got to be great for staff. Uh, we are very nervous about uh, the stresses that both special educators and general educators are under. Uh, we see a shortage of special educators across the country, shortage of folks with mental health expertise who want to work in schools. So we want to help kids, but we also want to help staff. And lastly, we need to do it within uh, your budget constraints. Uh, we believe all three are possible. Um, and I think just first and foremost, the important belief is that this is not an either or. Are we going to you know, be fiscally responsible or help kids? Are we going to be great for kids or help our staff? And we want to do all of it, and we believe you can. Uh, we believe that a great deal of best practice research and real life experience says this can be done. It was Winston Churchill who said the difference between a riddle and an enigma is that a riddle has an answer. Uh, how to support kids who struggle is more of a riddle than an enigma. Uh, central to that is a systems thinking approach. I think too often uh, we get asked or people ask, hey, do we need What's the role of paraprofessionals? Is co-teaching a great idea? What about intervention? Those are interesting questions, but taken in isolation, they're not going to fundamentally improve uh, outcomes for kids. And as many as best practices may exist, and this is going to work of John Hattie, what works Clearinghouse, we also know that every district is different. Culture and context matter a lot. And the work we do, we spend as much time getting to know you and your culture and context, and making sure any recommendations are tightly connected to your realities. We believe in focus. A short list is better than a long list. And this one surprises people sometimes, but general education is a huge part of the answer. So our work will spend 50% uh, of its time looking at what you do in general education, as well as special education or English language learners. We can't create silos. And lastly, and as a former board member, I say this with pride, no student ever benefited from a consultant's report. Our process is designed to bring about positive change, not just a great report. Um, as I said, this is driven by best practices. Um, I think it's important to know that a best practice is not one great teacher. What we want to do is scalable. It's not a program. These are not simple things that you buy and purchase. But there are things that are systemic. Um, they work in your complex world. And that they've been proven effective in, in many, many settings. Other thing that sometimes surprises people is this. When we use the term, and I've used it a few times already, students who struggle. Uh, that is not a term you typically see coming from the government. You know, we've got. Students who struggle is intentionally a broad definition. Yes, it's kids with disabilities, it's kids at risk, it's English language learners, it's kids who struggle to read, it is kids with social emotional behavioral needs. Uh, kids who struggle is a wide definition and our review uh, takes that very broad look. Um, the work in the review will cover, uh, as I said, very broad, our recommendations will be very focused. We're going to look broadly uh, across a wide range of academic needs, um, both elementary and secondary. Um, we're going to look equally deeply around social, emotional, and behavioral needs, um, ranging from mental health support to discipline to uh, behavior management, behavior prevention, um, PBIS, the, 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 uh, the, the full gamut. But also we're going to look at um, how special education, English language learners, general education, how do all those departments and folks work together? Are they, Do things run smoothly? Are there silos? Could communication or alignment be better? Uh, we're also, because for districts like yours that uh, use third party partners uh, to provide services, we'll take a look at those for, are they integrated? Are they effective? Are they the best way to serve students? So we're gonna look very broadly uh, across really all the aspects of what it takes to uh, significantly build upon improving supports for students who struggle. 
Uh, let me talk a little bit about the process. Um, it is both quantitative and qualitative. Both are really, really important. Uh, a great number of interviews um, with district leaders, board members, um, stakeholder focus groups, uh, upwards of 100 to 150 people typically, uh, including parents, teachers, general ed and special ed, paraprofessionals. Uh, again, um, incredibly wide range of stakeholders. Uh, district leadership is a partner in helping us make sure we talk to all the right people and all the right groups. Uh, we'll also visit classrooms. That gives us a great deal of qualitative information. On the quantitative side, we will do benchmarking. We will, um, because special educators and others do so much, we really want to understand the magnitude of what they're asked to do. We will do something called staff schedule sharing, where they'll share what they've done for a week. Uh, we'll review your third party contracts and we'll take a hard look at all the folks you've got uh, who are there to help kids who struggle and really taking a look particularly around roles and responsibilities is there clarity are people allowed to play to their strengths um can are you getting the most out of the folks you've got and are you making their work the most impactful and the most sustainable um, all of this is built on the idea and you'll see the very first step is to create momentum for change again our goal is not to create a report it is to create meaningful difference for kids and the process is very inclusive for that reason. Um, it helps create a shared vision. Um, these are not recommendations that are in a vacuum. They're not recommendations um, that don't connect to a theory of action. And we'll also use the process to celebrate what's going well. And an important part of this work and really the step one is what we call creating a guiding coalition um, we want to model and practice broad-based inclusive uh, planning. So again, with the partnership with the leadership, we will create a guiding coalition, typically about 20 folks or so. It'll include teachers, administrators, general ed, special ed, uh, all the levels within the school system so that we are getting feedback um, throughout our process, both around our ideas, but the process itself uh, from a wide range of stakeholders to make sure you're in sync with your culture um, and respectful of how the way things work in the district. Uh, one of the more innovative pieces that we do is the schedule sharing, where, where staff will share, like special educators, speech therapists, um, what they did for a week. And the reason we do this is they do so much and they are so stressed. And it is surprisingly easy for people to tell us all the things they do and not nearly as easy to tell us how much they really do on item one versus item five. And that's because humans are pretty lousy at doing that. We overstate the things we don't like doing. I will tell you, I spend hours every month exercising. I don't, I just don't like doing it. So it feels um, like a lot more. Um, we also tend to overstate um, the things we think we should be doing a lot of. So this just helps create this really fabulous fact base um, that allows us and the district leaders and the staff themselves to reflect on if these are all the things I'm doing, or is this the best use of my time to make the greatest impact on kids? It's a fascinating process, very insightful. Um, let me stop there. I, I could go all night, but I promise I won't and love to take uh, your questions and I will figure out how to stop sharing my screen as well. I just did, and hopefully you can still see and hear me. Yep. Oh, Thank you, Dave. Thank you so much. And uh, looks like, Chuck, do you have a question? I, I do. Thank you for the presentation. Nice meeting you, uh, Mr. Levinson, uh, via the virtual world. Yes, thank uh, you. Same. Um, your process, how long does it usually take as far as the timeline, like, you know, I saw the steps and they look great, but what's the timeline of the process sure. typically? Yep. So it's typically about four months, throw the summer in. Some people get a lot of work done over the summer. Some not so much, um, you know, from in the perfect world, we would do a little bit of work over the summer, uh, particularly with the folks who are around, uh, start collecting data and things like that. And ideally have this work done uh, by December. 
so that as you go into you know serious planning for the future year, you want to have our insights, this experience, and hopefully you know the vision and the buy-in uh, before you get too far down the path of making plans for the next year. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Um, other questions? Yeah, yeah, I have a question. Thank you very much for the presentation. My name is David Parker. Um, how is this presented uh, to the faculty and staff? Uh, um, also, you know, we're in the process now of replacing a superintendent. Um, is that problematic in terms of the review and um, uh, work that you do? If you know, who, are you that independent that you can come in and you know? Uh, make yourself available and therefore complete this task without, you know, with a sort of, in, given the transition that we're in. Nate, thank you. Yeah, sure. Uh, great question. And, you know, as a former superintendent, uh, it, it's funny that um, doing this work as a new superintendent or sometimes a new director of special education is coming in, we think it's the best possible time to do this. Um, if you think about what a new superintendent does, any good superintendent, I know you'll find a good one, they want to learn and listen and understand what they've got. Um, we're going to be doing that with them. Uh, they will know vastly more about how the district currently uh, serves kids who struggle, that very wide range of students. It is exactly what I think any new superintendent would want to know. Um, by the time we're getting around to uh, formulating um, our findings, they will have settled in um, as we are moving through the final stage where we're you know, kind of leading prioritization discussion and fit with culture discussions. This is around November and December. Um, they're going to be active participants in this, but I'll tell you as a superintendent, this, this is a gift. Uh, there's an awful lot of legwork is going to be done. Uh, it's not going to be done to them or without them. <clears throat> the front end, they don't have a lot to do. Um, and on the back end, where they really want to have input, uh, they will and they will have been, I think, settled in by then. So personally, I think this is great timing, and I wish somebody did it for me uh, when I took over a district. Thank you. Uh, Tom Croto. Tom, go ahead. I hope you unmute. Thank you. I, Mr. Levinson, thank you. My name is Tom Proto. And my question talks about what the end game kind of looks like. So once we've, we've worked with an organization like yours, what sorts of things are typical that you leave a district with um, so that things can be carried for? Sure. And I know that's a very broad question, but I, I'm sure there are some some particulars that you leave in place? Absolutely, so um, great question, because as I said, uh, the goal is not a report, it's meaningful change that continues for years, and this does take multiple years to fully implement, whatever the plan is. Now, here's what you'll have when we are done um, that will really help drive this forward. First of all, you will have between the leadership at both the school and central office and others, a shared understanding of best practices. Um, it is fascinating that you know, str you know, serving struggling students has been a top priority for decades. Uh, but the depth of understanding of what really works, it's not as deep as it could be everywhere. So one is through this process, uh, there's going to be widespread understanding of the research. Two, uh, through this process, there'll be deep understanding of where you align and perhaps don't with those best practices. Uh, third, most importantly, you will have a short focus list of things that would make a big impact for kids and great for your teachers, but it said that has also been vetted to for vetted and shaped to adapt to your culture and climate. Um, and then you're also going to have uh, through our help, but th through the, the leadership and the staff, um, prioritization. So at the end, you have great clarity on what you ought to do, why you ought to do it, um, that it's been adjusted to fit your culture and climate. And I will say that in at least 80% of the districts who work, 
you have a burning sense of urgency um, that I will tell you, having led so many of these sessions, particularly towards the end, and the prioritization ends, you will see principals and teachers turn to the superintendent and say things like, so you're not going to let this drop, right? Like mm -hmm. This isn't just going to be one of those meetings that goes nowhere. Because what generally happens is people see that there is a way to make things better for kids and better for your staff, mm -hmm. and it's affordable. Well, that is the momentum that makes this go forward, um, because that is what everybody has wanted to do from the get-go. Um, the last thing I will say is, and it's not included in the proposal, but about 20, 25% of the districts also say, hey, we would like your help to implement, and that is certainly available. Most implement on their own. Um, but it does keep our recommendations very realistic. When I know there's a reasonable chance you're going to turn around and say, Nate, come on back here and help us do it. And I think that really keeps the work grounded in reality as well. Great. Uh, Gina, go ahead. Yes. Um, good, good to see you again, virtually. Um, yes, same. How is all of this going to be affected by remote learning? And the, I know that one of the big pieces is the, the data of what the, what the teachers are doing on any given week um, and what they, what they spend their time doing and uh, the database of, of um, you know, the breakdown of what they're doing. But how does that change because of remote learning? And what happens, honestly, if we're not back in the fall or if we're back for a little bit and then we're back to remote because there's an unfortunate surge in the fall, or yep. how is that all affected by all of this? Yep, no, uh, another excellent question, and you know, it, it's funny, uh, eight weeks ago I would have said, I wonder if this is hard or difficult to do remotely. Uh, we are doing about nine of these studies as we speak um, all across the country, and I've not been on a plane in seven weeks. So as we speak, we are doing uh, th these exact same studies. Um, we have one that's going on across the entire state of Wyoming, 49 districts wow. uh, simultaneously. Uh, what we're doing there, um, it turns out that virtually, actually everything except that schedule sharing is easy to do uh, remotely. Uh, for that schedule sharing, yeah, we're going to want to be thoughtful about when we do it. Um, in the case of some districts, what they've and Ian, I don't have a crystal ball. I don't think you guys do either as to when it's going to be the right time to do the schedule sharing. Uh, what we're doing in some districts is we've said, hey, uh, the world's not to our liking. We don't actually get to control everything. Let's share what we know, um, which will keep us on pace and keep a lot of good ideas surfacing. And if we, if it's, if we can't do the schedule sharing, we're not going to complete the work. We won't call it a finished report. We'll do it in two steps, interim findings, and then we'll update it um, with the schedule sharing. Uh, that certainly it's some extra work on us. I can assure you it is no extra cost to you all. That if we, if it makes sense to do an interim report um, and start the conversations without the schedule sharing, and that'll be a decision that the leadership team makes. Um, but that's what we're I've got a district in um, Maryland essentially said, hey, you guys have learned so much. And we are so eager to get going. Let's do the planning retreat together uh, this spring. And we will do the schedule sharing when we can in the fall. And then we'll come back together and wrap it all up uh, then. So we're flexible. Hopefully you're flexible. Uh, we'll get to all the steps in the order that makes the most sense. But at least from our perspective, and it's obviously a decision you have to make, uh, the kids who struggle and the staff who are stressed just don't think they should wait. And if we can get 80 or 90 percent of the value sooner and let the last piece come later, um, that seemed like a good a good plan. And as I said, it's a little more work for us, but not not more work or cost for you all. Great, thank you. Are there other questions, uh, Danielle? I know you were had to leave, and then we're back on. Um, so if you have a question, you'd be welcome to answer, ask it. No, I don't have any questions, just internet problems. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, though. Yep, okay. I have another question. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Dave. Um, 
these these times right now are, are really challenging. I work with special ed kids and I have my whole life. And how they've been responding to this is really variable. There's a really wide range of ways that they've been responding to our current situation. Um, our district has been through a fair amount of turmoil in the past year. Would it not be better for us to settle down a little bit first and make this proposal once we discover how we're moving forward with a new principal, with a new superintendent? I, I really am one that, that feels strongly that this should be done. Where I am um, challenged is the timing not the process. Yep. And I don't think, quite frankly, that it could be the same because the educating I'm doing with my students right now is not the same. It's with some kids it's phenomenal, with other kids it's not, and particularly our special needs population, including kids that have been traumatized, kids that are on the spectrum. Some of them are plugging in every day. It would be really, really hard to look at the quality district that we have through the lens of special education right now. And, I mean, with all due respect, the timing for me is really problematic. So thank you. Sure. No, it's a, a good question and a good point. So one is we would not be assessing um, how you're delivering services remotely. So that this is not an assessment of remote services. So if um, we would... So that, that's the first point. And I agree that that would not be, I think, the best or, or most useful. Uh, second is, you know, the timing clearly will play out as things return to something resembling normal. As I said, we're flexible. Um, we'll start when it makes sense and we'll pause if we have to pause and move full steam ahead when that makes sense. Uh, all, every step of the process will be done uh, in conjunction with and approval from the district leadership. So it's not that we're going to plow through. Uh, the other part that, and again, skipping the fact that we would not want to assess how you're doing remote learning currently. Um, our experience has been, obviously I don't know your district well, but the kinds of things we're looking at, your approach to how you serve kids uh, who struggle, these are approaches that quite honestly typically develop over years, if not decades. Um, that they become the culture and the way things are done in the district. Um, and so for the analysis of where you are, um, you know, I think when you come back to, to being in schools, you will come back to where you were because it's, you know, it's not looking at what you did in the last 30 days or 60 days. Um, and I think as far as thinking about uh, the planning for where you go forward, um, it, it's interesting and, you know, everybody looks at the world um, through their own experiences. We have a fair number of uh, districts that are accelerating this work um, because they're saying, hey, our kid, we're gonna have more kids who struggle than ever before. Uh, we're likely to see more social and emotional challenges than ever before because of uh, the situation we're in. And they're really eager to uh, think about and plan how do we best meet what is going to be a growing need, both academically, uh, socially, emotionally, and on the mental health side. So I totally understand why some people would may want to wait and totally understand why some people want to move forward. Um, we're here when you're ready, and uh, you all get to decide what's the right time. Uh, I will say as a superintendent, when I was superintendent, I would have been excited to have this, but I'm biased too. Nay, I, I, I don't deny the, the value of what you do. Our faculty and staff have been through a significant amount of change and demands. And when you add this on top of it, not what you're doing, but what we're going through right now, I really want this to happen. It seems to me premature to, to do this. Why, why maybe we have a superintendent, we could start this in January. Is there any problem with with putting something like this off, if we had good intentions along the way, because I think this should be done. Yep, I'm no. struggling with the current situation. Sure, so uh, a few thoughts for you. So one, teachers themselves would not be kind of engaged and impacted in this until the fall or even late fall. 
So, you know, it's, it's, we don't want to be adding one more thing to their plate today, not in the spring, not in the summer. So to, to be clear, we're talking about starting in the fall. Um, and here's how I think about it. And again, I totally empathize and understand your thinking. Um, kids have been struggling for decades. I mean, the achievement gap is about, you know, we, we, I think we first measured it 20 years ago. We probably had it 40 years ago. And people call it the, the stubborn achievement gap because it's been around a long time. Here's where my dilemma is, or the thing I want you to think about on timing. I had said we wanted to kind of finish around December and January. And the reason for that is, again, I spent six years on a school board. Around December and January, you're making a lot of plans, budgets, staffing plans, priorities. If we start in January, um, we're going to finish in June, which is fine. You're not making any changes in June. Your budget's done. Your staffing is done. You might even have voted it already. Um, whatever hiring, and it's, it's done. So it means that you have to wait an entire year. So unfortunately, what starts out as seeming, hey, why don't we wait four months, which again, I understand your thinking, uh, turns into it will be two years before these ideas impact kids. And I understand you can't do everything at once, and two years seems like a long time as well before the kids can see the difference. So it basically it adds a year, uh, just given the normal cycles of school district planning. So can I ask? J yeah, Chuck, go ahead. All right, thank you. So, and, and I liked what you just said, Nate, uh, quite a bit. Uh, but one thing you said that really resonated with me, um, that a lot of the, the culture of how we uh, educate struggling kids, how we support struggling kids, has developed over years, if not decades. Mm -hmm. Is that a fair statement? And I think that's kind of what, I, I, from what I'm hearing, and correct me if I'm wrong, you, you deal with the pragmatic, but you also deal with kind of the philosophy which impacts the pragmatic. Um, I would say we are both visionary and pragmatic. I think Got the, it. the greatest compliment we're ever paid is that we think out of the box and we're very practical at the same time. Understood. Um, but I do like what you said, and it, it really makes a lot of sense to move ahead in my mind now. You lost you there, um, Chuck. Oh, can you hear me now? I can hear you. Yep. All right, all right, good. Uh, it, it, it really makes a lot of sense in my mind, the timeline you just laid out, because that is when we're going to be making decisions for the coming year as far as using, as far as staffing, as far as supporting struggling students, uh, both from a staffing, a resource, and consulting perspective. Uh, and a lot of what you're looking at is not just a snapshot of the last six months, and it would also benefit the new superintendent. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, if I could weigh in as well, I mean, obviously, I'm not going to be here. Uh, there'll be a new superintendent, and obviously, I want, you know, the best for the district going forward. So one might argue, well, you don't have a horse in the race, so does it really matter? I suppose so. One can make that argument, but I am invested in the district. I care about the district. And to some of the points that have already been made, um, there is a cultural shift already beginning to take place in this district. Uh, folks are looking beyond uh, where they were before. Uh, and yes, as has been alluded to, there's been some very traumatic issues that have occurred. We're moving away from that. And I think people are beginning to realize just how great the district is. I think as Jenny said, we were having a conversation earlier, it's the best kept secret in the state of New Hampshire. Concord School District is alive and well. There are many, many great things happening here in this district from K through 12. And I'm very proud to have been associated with this in the short time I've been here. And I would like to see this happen because I think it's the next natural step. And I think as Chuck alluded to, you know, we've had maybe 10 years or so of, of opportunities that just haven't really materialized in the way perhaps that they it, it, to our best desire. And so having someone like you come in and to say, and I really like your point about struggling learners because we're kind of banding a large group of people together. It's not just the kids who are uh, uh, in an IEP. It's not just the kids who are on the spectrum. It's not just the kids who have behavioral issues. It's a combination of all kids who struggle for a whole variety of reasons. And I mean, I love the, the wonderful analogy, you know, Chuck and I are in the class. Chuck's identified, I'm not, but I'm still a struggling learner. Chuck gets all the help, I don't. 
That's not the way it's supposed to work. We're supposed to get a cumulative effect where everybody is rolled into this and we, each person gets an opportunity to advance. And so it's not Chuck versus me. It's Chuck and me together rising up to meet the demands and expectations of the teacher. And that's all of the folks working together on behalf of us as students. And I think that's where we want to get to. We don't want to be in these compartmentalized uh, uh, positions that we're currently in. We want to kind of raise the whole thing up. And I think teachers need to hear that, administrators need to hear that, and the community needs to hear that. So I think the timing is perfect to do this, to be honest with you. That's my position. Um, I'm going to jump in, and I know Tom has a question too, um, but just to speak briefly to it as a long-term board member, I think that these are questions that year after year after year in the budget process we talk about, and then it becomes very difficult to get a handle on them outside of the budget process and even within the budget process we don't have kind of the full picture of all of our practices and we don't have that kind of stakeholder engagement and vision combined with very specific pragmatic suggestions so i do think it would be very helpful um, and i get the concern about timing and it's certainly a question for the board to debate but it's, it's been a long time coming for us to have a process like this, and I, I hope we can do it soon, even if not now. Um, Tom, go ahead. Thank you. It, it, there's sort of a second delay for my mute button to work, but at any rate, I'm figuring it out. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to follow up on Mr. Parker's concern because it, it, it strikes me as well. But I think, uh, Nate, Levinson, I think you could probably allay my fears a little bit by just kind of taking me down the road of what sort of time commitment, what sort of general meeting commitment, what sort of input commitment it would mean for our teachers. I, I'm pretty sure our administration would be, you know, would meet with open arms to go through this process, but I I spent a little time teaching about you know, 25 years or so, and I can remember saying, can you just let me teach sometimes <laughs> when there was new, you know, new stuff going down the road? And, and not to say that this wouldn't be just so beneficial, but I, I want to know really what does it feel like for a teacher in the Concord School District sure. if we were to say, let's go forward with this, and what does it mean for them? Thank you. Um, so our goal, and I'll answer your question directly in about 30 seconds, is we want to maximize engagement and minimize effort. We know how full everybody's plate is. So for the primary way in which um, teachers are engaged in this is one is through the focus groups. Uh, they're about 45-minute meetings. So if you're a, a particular teacher, it's about 45 minutes. Um, people volunteer. Um, I will tell you that our biggest problem is we cannot get people out of the room, um, but it is still 45 minutes. People want us to know what they're thinking and what they do. Uh, the schedule sharing takes about 30 to 40 minutes once. And again, we think about uh, with our advisory group, uh, what's the right week and timing to do that? And obviously, that is the timing is always important. It'll be more important than ever given what's going on. But for a typical teacher, it's a 45-minute focus group, which is not every teacher, but those who want to participate. Um, for special education folks, um, it is about 30 to 40 minutes to share their schedule. And then there'll be a handful of teachers who will be on the, um, the guiding coalition. Again, entirely voluntary, usually oversubscribe. Um, and that group will meet typically, I would say over the course of the six months, for three, two to three hour meetings. Uh, so it's not huge. That definitely is the biggest chunk of time. And I think for some teachers, they might say, hey, just let me teach. I don't want to be part of it. That's fine. We're looking for two to four who are thinking this is so darn important. I, I would love to have a voice and be part of it. Um, I'll be honest, we have not had through the years uh, much pushback from staff at all. Uh, total candor. We really step in it. If we pick the wrong week to hold meetings, the wrong week to hold the focus groups, which is why we have learned to have the guiding coalition help us uh, vet those weeks and vet those timings so it doesn't overlap with, once I will say, unintentionally parent-teacher conferences, which 
did not go over very well. Um, okay. Well, thank you. I appreciate your answer to that. Uh, it's very important to me and, and I'm sure our other board members that that our teachers have, you know, having come through what they're coming through now, as are all teachers, mm -hmm. that they, you know, that they are able to have good energy around this. Thank you. I think, you know, just to follow up on that, though, because it really is so important, um, I think that somewhere in the last 10 years, with the frustration over the achievement gap, and we should be frustrated, um, I think that there's been this growing pressure to, quote, do something, and that has pushed the pressure onto teachers. Um, this work is as much about making the work more rewarding, successful, sustainable for your staff. I mean, one of the big challenges is great teachers are retiring or leaving the profession because the work is too hard. And I think when, when they realize, which is usually part of the communication, that it is as important to help kids and equally as important to help the staff get to a, you know, a better place for them and for their kids, um, this is pretty welcomed by, by teachers. Uh, not, and I get it. You can do things like this. The teachers say, hey, why, why are we doing it? This is structured very differently. Nate, what you don't see me is nodding my head in agreement. So <laughs> right. if you were in a real meeting, you would see that more often. Thank right. <laughs> you. Good to know. I, I hate these virtuals. You can't get any body language. <laughs> Nate, and, and I actually, my question is also for Dr. Bass. I, I don't question for a minute that this isn't a necessary um, thing to do. I, you know, I really feel that we do need to review our our, our uh, special specialized learning programs and student services. Um, I would also ask Dr. Bass what if he could put out a questionnaire to the faculty, if he could put a put out get some feedback from our constituents to see not only is this something that they would like to do now, I know many of them feel they would. I would and and are they willing to spend the money that's involved in doing this? Um, given that we're facing an economic crisis, um, we are going to get as taxpayers a big pushback from anything that we're doing. So I just bring that to people's attention. Um, I really, I'm, I'm a big proponent of this, but I am nervous that we're going to get some major pushback given the expense and timing yes yeah, so so good good points let me respond to that i mean certainly the questionnaire and survey to faculty and administration i think is a a very uh worthwhile venture to do and get a feel for them as to you know where we're at and how they would feel about moving forward in a project like this and that's an excellent idea and so that we could get all that information before the june meeting so on point number one i'm in full agreement as far as the costs are concerned and you know jack can weigh in on this because jack and i had a conversation about it I mean, there are two ways we're discussing going about doing this. If the board chose to go with Nate, uh, we're not suggesting that we add anything to the budget that we, we've created. So there would be no additions to the budget in October. Well, we would we have two choices we could make. Choice number one is we would pay installments out of leftover monies, if you will, in the current budget, one in July, one in October, and one in March. And then for the following year, we could either budget for that or still continue to do the same thing, which is to pay out of existing monies. So that's that's option A. Option B is, might even be a better way to go, Jack can speak to this, this is going into the special ed reserve fund and using monies for that because that's exactly what it's about. And that really wouldn't cost the taxpayer or the budget uh, anything. And Jack, if you want to weigh in on that, that would be great. Sure. I Thank you, Frank. I think you have a variety of flexibility as it comes to the end of the year. We're starting to calculate what things look like uh, with all the utility bills and a variety of different programs that didn't run. So between year-end money, your special education trust fund, uh, I think you'll have flexibility to do what you feel is uh, the right thing to do. Thank you, Jack. Dr. Bass, what was the cost of the proposal? I know I don't have it on my screen. Yeah, the full cost is seventy-five thousand dollars, and so what I was proposing, and I worked this out with Nate. It's a little bit different than what he would normally do, but he likes us, and so he's been uh, very gracious in helping us out. So it'd be fifteen thousand in July, fifteen thousand in October, fifteen thousand in March, with the remainder being paid the following July. 
whether that remainder comes out of uh, the very sources that Jack said or not is, you know, obviously a question for the board. Okay, thank you. And I think Nate had said the program, you know, depending on, I mean, my sense is that I think people are going to be really looking forward to this and want to play ball with data as much as possible. So in that case, I think two years would, would be more than suffice uh, for what's necessary. I think they can speak to this in other districts. It might take three years. I don't see that happening here. I, I think that the timing and, and the position of the district in terms of where it's at would be a natural fit. And I think things would move along very nicely. And is this something that we would decide tonight, or would we wait till June to decide about it? What do you think? So, so I think now I think Dave raised, raised a good point. Well, let's let's get get some uh, feedback from the staff. I think that's an important uh, element to add into this. I think the board would need a little bit more time, perhaps, to kind of think this through. Uh, and so, why don't we bring it back to the June meeting? And at the June meeting, folks can make a decision. Now, if the board is so willing at this point in time to make a decision, that's fine. Uh, but I'm only suggesting, given the conversation thus far, that it probably makes better sense to collect some information, think about it some more, and then have the conversation again at a June meeting. That won't be a problem for Nate one way or another, because if we did vote it through in June, he'd be ready to start his uh, coalition government, if you will, uh, in the summertime and would be off and running. Yeah, I think that makes sense. I mean, I think we've had a great conversation, and it's great having you here, Nate, and being able to answer all the questions. It would be good for us to have the public be able to weigh in and just have a little more information before we make a decision as a board. Yeah, and, and could could we have three or four districts that have gone through this process, Nate, to talk with them, possibly a subcommittee that could get some feedback? I don't question the quality of your work, but I think we have an obligation to 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 get some feedback yeah i could speak to that because uh we do have a subcommittee uh jenny and gina are on the committee with me uh so why don't you leave that with us we'll spearhead that we'll check in with nate we'll get three or four uh other districts to uh for us to talk to and get some information and some feedback which we can then present to the board in june dave does that make a sense from your perspective terrific thank you very much okay good thanks all right, wonderful. Well, thank you so much for joining um, our remote meeting. That was very comprehensive. So yeah, thanks, well, I appreciate Nate. it. My pleasure that this Zoom, it's not great, but it does get the job done. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Uh, have a good night, everybody. Yeah, thank thank you. you. Thank you. Okay, Dr. Okay, Bass, I so think you've got a few more updates. I so do, we'll I do, and I'm, I'm watching the time. I mean, it's almost 8.30, so I'm going to condense some of my stuff. I mean, I, I wanted to go through and speak to you about what's happening at each building regarding the remote learning. I just don't think in the interest of time I should do that. Suffice it to say that every single building is experiencing really neat, robust, and creative uh, adventures, if you will, in this remote learning. We've heard from parents across the board, we've heard from teachers across the board, and principals and teachers just being very creative in how they approach this. And you're seeing the results, you know, with the student work that I've identified, and there's more. I mean, I don't have it all. I'm just giving you some of the pieces that have come to me. So, again, I can't say enough good about what uh, district folks have done in this time of need. And again, as I said earlier, and I think it bears repeating, it's not about academics. It's about community. It's about connection. And it's about helping out those that might be less fortunate than you are. So uh, I couldn't be more pleased with the reaction of our students and faculty and our parents, and, uh, for that matter. Um, all speaking of um, the uh, COVID-19 and what we're doing, um, as you may know, I think there's a couple articles in the newspaper about it. We ran a food drive last month. We're doing, we did another one today. Uh, so that continues. We are continuing to feed families throughout the time. Uh, we're also doing another material run. We did a material run, I think, uh, last two weeks ago or so. And that was, you know, glue and yardsticks and uh, pencils and paper and, you know, all those kinds of things that people may not have at home. We're going to do another one of those runs um, later this week. So, again, we're in a constant mode of trying to make sure that our parents and our families are being well equipped. For those who don't know, we also worked with Comcast to make sure that any family that doesn't have internet, we have worked with them to make sure that they do get free internet uh, during the time that this virus uh, is in play. And then if they want to continue after that, if they can only, they charge $10 a month. So we've been working with that as well to make sure folks are able to um, um, have the computer uh, uh, applicability uh, with, the, with their, with their uh, programs from school. Um, so graduation. Um, you know, I wanted to be in a position to come before you tonight and say, we're all set. I've got permission from the commissioner. I mean, I'm 99% there. 
I'm still waiting. I think what's happening is the governor just hasn't quite given the okay. But just so folks know, we're trying very, very hard to run an actual outdoor graduation. More than likely, if we get permission, we'll do it in three phases. So it'll be a long day, but we'll have Commons A, Commons B, and Commons C separated by about four hours. We came up with some really creative ways in which we can have the band playing and have the chorus playing. Governor, uh, Senator Shaheen, well, she was a governor too. Uh, Senator Shaheen will be giving us a congratulatory message, which we're going to put on the big board. Uh, we'll also have some guest speakers. So um, we actually measured out Memorial Field with a tape measure. So we feel very comfortable that we can put a six-foot cubicle around every kid and every parent. Um, so we know we can do it. It's just now a question of whether we're going to get permission from the governor uh, and the commissioner to be able to do that. That date still remains to be June 13th. So I'll keep you posted. I think we feel comfortable that we can wait till about May 15th. But after that, we may have to go to Plan B. But I'll, you know, stay tuned. I'll let you know as soon as uh, word comes in. Any questions on that? Frank, that's awesome. Good for I, you. I, Good for you. Because this is important stuff. Yeah. I really appreciate it a lot. Thank you. That, that is great. Thank you for your hard work and your planning, you and the whole leadership team at the district. Thank you. Um, Frank, okay. Yes, Frank, thank you. Um, the one thing I'll ask is to be sure we're not only looking at the measurements of where people will be, but how they come in and they exit as well. Yeah, great point, Jim. It's funny you mention that because we're talking about it and then someone brought it up in one of the meetings we had. We said, oh my God, that's a whole other kettle of fish that we're going to have to figure out. You're right. We're going to have to have some sort of funneling system whereby we don't have anybody you know, herded together because that just defeats the whole purpose of it. So we're in the process of figuring that out, getting them in and getting them out in an orderly way whereby they're not in contact with one another. Thank you for thank bringing that up. No, thank you for paying attention to it and already thinking about it. Thank you. We, all, we, all, we also have um, a plan in place to provide every graduate with a mask. Uh, customized Concord High School graduation mask. Thank you for bringing that up, Barbara. Yes, Barbara had reached out to me, and I got it was a wonderful suggestion. We'll have a mask for everybody there. So, I mean, that's just going to be terrific. So I think, you know, again, I'll keep pressuring folks to, to, to understand that we will be able to follow the social distancing rules. And so as long as we can prove that to them, I'm pretty hopeful that the governor is going to say, well, okay, I know we're in his backyard, too, so maybe that'll help. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm hopeful. I'm very hopeful we can do this. Oh, that's great. Thank you. And 40 years from now, that mask is going to be quite a collector's item. Yeah, that's right. Good point. Good point. Exactly. Okay, moving on. Um, so the issue of grading was brought up. Actually, it was brought up at a board meeting, I want to say, in March, and then was brought up again in a April. And so, you know, the question is, what are we going to do? And I think I said at the last meeting, well, we'll make sure we protect you know, the juniors who are going to be seniors next year and things will be status quo. And I think one board member said, well, maybe that's not such a great idea after all, because there are still some issues with that. So I took that under consideration. And so what I've decided to do is to form an ad hoc committee. So the ad hoc committee, you may be surprised, is going to have seven students in it, uh, myself, two administrators, and I say three teachers. Nobody else will be on the committee. Uh, a notable absences from the committee are the uh, principal of the building, um, any parents, any school board members, um, and anybody else from the central office. So I'm trying to keep this as a very neutral uh, uh, party, if you will, just looking at the facts and figuring out what's, what makes the most sense. I had an initial conversation with the students, uh, and I was really, um, what's the word, um, uh, excited, I guess, uh, for lack of a better word, about, you know, what their positions were and, and where we might be able to go uh, from here. So I think the prospect of being able to come up with something that makes sense, that people feel comfortable with and people can understand, that's going to be the big one, uh, before September rolls around is very possible. I really feel strongly about that. So, um, you know, the, the facts will speak for themselves. Let's have a committee where our first meeting is this Friday. Uh, I'll keep you posted and let you know how things go. But again, I'm, I'm feeling very optimistic about uh, where the kids are at and what they're looking for. Uh, and now it's a question of, you know, how the faculty fits into all that and, and, and where the issues take us. Um, I mean, obviously, as I'm sure many of you know, 
consistency is a huge factor in all of this and making sure that it's an even playing field across the, uh, across the spectrum. Uh, but there are many other issues which I won't go into. Uh, bottom line is I, I feel comfortable that this committee will be very helpful in being able to iron out something that makes sense for everybody. Now, let's assume that we come to some sort of an agreement about where we think we're at. Then it would be our responsibility to go to the principal the building and go to the community and say, here's what we came up with, this is what we're trying to do, and then the community would certainly have a chance to weigh in, and, and maybe there might be some, you know, some changes or amendments uh, based upon, you know, some of their suggestions, but our goal is to try and get this as ironclad as we can before we go forward. I don't want to come forward and have a lot of holes in this. Any questions on that? Great. Okay. <laughs> um, I just uh, for, for for folks who may be wondering, um, the seven students who are involved in this project with me are the seven students who are also currently in this uh, seminar that I've been running. And just a footnote on that, I've said this to a couple board members already, but I'll say it to the community wherever you're listening. I mean, the the output those kids are producing is just mind-boggling. Uh, they all wrote papers for me. Remember, this is a class that's non-graded. There's no grades. It doesn't count. You don't get credit. It doesn't do anything for you other than the fact that you want to do it. So this is learning for learning's sake, and the papers I've gotten have been off the charts. I just don't know how else to describe it. I think, Jenny, you've seen a couple of them. Uh, I mean, we're just very, very impressed with the Unknown talent, participant creativity, is now joining. and the uh, excitement that the kids have brought. And I don't say a whole lot, uh, as Jenny and Gina will attest. I mean, they do all the talking, and it's really, really good conversation. So again, it just speaks to the quality of the students we have here. And I think if you give them an opportunity to, to excel and to shoot to the moon, they will. And uh, the proof's in the pudding, so I, I couldn't be more pleased with that. Um, yeah, it's been a privilege to be able to, to, to sit in and basically be a fly on the wall for these conversations. And it was amazing. There was one class session where Dr. Bass inadvertently dropped off, and the students just kept right on going, and they facilitated their own conversation. It was amazing. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, let's see. Our next big issue, um, eighth grade field trip. So, um, I know Unknown you... Unknown participant is now exiting. Uh, uh, we put that on the agenda. So, again, I gave you all the board a uh, very detailed background, but for those who don't know, I'll try to go through this as quickly as I can. Um, the eighth grade field trip, which we always have every year going down to D.C., could not happen this year because of the uh, pandemic. Unfortunately for the 88 parents who paid well over $1,000 for each one of those tickets, um, the best the company can do for them is about $250 in refund. Um, so we worked with the Attorney General's office, we talked to the regional manager, we talked to the CEO of the company, we talked to our attorney, we tried to finagle any other kind of arrangement we could that we thought would be to the best interest of both parties. But they made a very um, uh, what's the word, steadfast position that what they're doing for us is what they're doing for the entire country, and they're not deviating from that one iota. So obviously the parents were very uh, disconsolate, to say the least, um, and felt it was patently unfair, which I agree with. Uh, for us to try and you know, forge a legal battle, which we could, was probably more, more expensive in the long run, and who knows how much time it would take. Uh, just for folks who are wanting, the AG's office did get back to us and said that that because the contract Kate that Levesque Levesque had, is and now so joining. they won't be able to do anything with it. So uh, Jack and I were talking, and I think I mentioned this in the um, uh, bullets to the uh, to the school board. Um, our first thought was to have seventh grade parents meet with the eighth grade parents, but of course that you know presents its own set of issues in terms of you know trying to arrange all that, and then. One parent had gotten back to me and said, well, how about this? How about if the school district were to buy the vouchers from the eighth grade parents? Because one of the um, opportunities the company will provide is if you don't want your $250 back, we'll give you a voucher, which is for the full amount of the trip. The voucher is good for two years, 24 months. So suppose there was another trip next year to D.C. You could use the voucher for that. And if you wanted to wait another year, you could do the same thing in the, in the second year. So that's when Jack and I got together and started looking at the possibility. Let's just say, Kate for argument's sake, the, the school district were to purchase all of those vouchers from the eighth grade parents. 
that would make it a lot easier for us to be able to sell them to the seventh grade parents. Now, we already talked to the regional manager and know that we can do this. Uh, so if the board uh, is willing to go forward with this, Jack and I feel very comfortable that we can pull this off in a way that does not put the district at risk, at least not too much risk. But I want to turn over to Jack to give you some of those details. And let, me, let me jump in yep. just by saying we did amend the agenda at the beginning. Um, yep. So I think we'll get into more detail on this when we get to that agenda item. But I did want Dr. Bass to give just a summary up front in case there were people who wanted to address this in public comments. So I think we could ask questions now, but we'll have a further conversation later as board members as well. So thank yep. you, Dr. Bass and Jack. Kenny, I'll hold off on my comments. I thought that's what you had done and amended the agenda. So I'll wait until that time. Okay. If that's what you just want. Is that what you want, Jenny? You want Jack to wait? Um, I think so. I mean, because if we're going to get into a detailed discussion of it, I, and I don't know whether there are folks on who want to comment, and if it turns out that we have, you know, questions that Jack could answer during the public comment period, then maybe we can we can get into that. Then um, I just wanted to make sure. Sure. That since it's now on the agenda, that anybody who wanted to comment knew what that new item was. Okay, so I'll move ahead. Uh, we'll come back to that. So uh, you have a number of folks that are coming up for um, hire. Uh, we're very pleased about the people we're able to hire. I think I mentioned in my notes to the board that, you know, a lot of us have been recruiting, actually going out and trying to get people to apply for the positions. We, we call the network, if you will, uh, and let them know that we're advertising. And if you know folks that would be interested, please have them apply. And that has produced some really good people, which you're going to be seeing from Larry in a few minutes. So we're really, really pleased about that. Um, you should also know that, you know, certification is a big issue for us. Uh, it is the superintendent's responsibility to make sure everyone is certified. So as, as these people come through, certification will be checked. And we have to do two, two things. One is, are they certified right now? And will they be certified, you know, when they actually start for us? Which brings me to another issue. Um, we are currently in the process of certification for all of the staff who are up for certification. That has to be done... Well, in normal circumstances, by June 30th, I believe the state is giving us an extra three weeks or four weeks because of the COVID virus. That won't be an issue for us. We'll have them all done by June 1st, more than likely. But the point I'm trying to make is there are really two issues with certification. One is currently, are you certified right now as we speak? And then are you also going to be certified as July 1st rolls around? My responsibility as a superintendent uh, is to make sure that when July 1st hits, Everyone who is going to be working for us either has a certification or is in what's called alternative one, two, three, or four, which is the state's way of saying probationary, and here are some steps that you have to do, but we're going to give you the nod and allow you to be quasi-certified, if you will, until such time that um, the uh, process of alternative one, two, three, or four has been complete. But it serves as in lieu of the certification. So it's a major responsibility for us. Uh, it is the responsibility of the superintendent, nobody else. Uh, and so it's something I take very seriously. So again, I just want to assure folks, everyone who currently works for us right now is certified, and everyone who will be working for us as of July 1st will also be certified. If they're not, they will not be working in this district. So I just want to be clear about that. Great. Thank you, Dr. Bass. Um, any more updates, or should we move no, on? No, I, I think I've got enough. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much. Um, let me note, I dropped off a couple of times, and I just wanted to ask, Jim, are you able to take over chairing the meeting in the event that I do drop off for some reason for a longer period of time? Yeah, I should be able to as long as I don't drop off, Jenny, yeah, but okay. I think so far okay. it's been pretty good. Anytime I've dropped off, I've been able to, to log right back on in less than 30 seconds, so okay. yes, I can. I'm prepared. Okay. Thank you. And um, hopefully it won't get past the two of us, but if it does, we'll have to see what happens. Somebody will pick it up. Um, so next we're moving into public comment on agenda items only. And so we had a, basically typically the way we've been handling this with our remote meetings is Jack has been go going through to see whether people want to comment. Um, Lyndon had an idea, which I mentioned during the intro, which is if there's anyone who is participating in the um, Microsoft Teams meeting and would like to speak, they should identify themselves. And we do have Caitlin Levesque, who has identified herself as having a public comment. So 
why don't we start with Caitlin, and then, Jack, if you could just go through the way that you have done this sure. in the past. And again, if there's anyone else who wants to type in on the public comment, then that would be great. So, and again, under our policy, um, we ask people to limit their time to five minutes. We are very open to email comments in addition. So, Caitlin, with that, if you would like to speak, please go ahead. Okay, so Caitlin had left, but someone just joined on a phone. Caitlin, was that you? Okay, yeah. go ahead. So he is I was now joining. Say, like, sorry, I was going to say I got into COTC because um, for the second year, and it helps me like learn about like how I learn about my career when I'm out of high school, and it when I had confidence in it. And I was nervous at first, but then I gained my confidence. So now I'm like better at like learning the like criteria and like learning more about it. Well, thank you so much for commenting and for participating. And it's very challenging. We have not had that many people who have commented um, since we started remote meetings. So thank you for your yeah. comments and your perseverance. And if I could chime in, Katie is a neighbor of mine, and uh, <laughs> she very much uh, loves the Concord School District and, and brads quite a bit about her experience at the CRTC. So thank you, Katie. Yeah. Thank you so you much, up. Katie. Yeah. I my neighbor is texting me and saying, great, great job. And like, it's been, um, it's been a fun experience and I want to keep doing it in my life. So. Well, thank you so much. And I hope we'll have regular face-to-face -face meetings soon so people won't have to dial in as persistently. But we really appreciate your persistence tonight. Thanks, Chuck, by the way. And, well, and Ms. Uh, Dr. Frank Bat and... Oh, yeah. Thank you, Katie. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. You're welcome. Okay, Jack, do you want to check and go through and just see what who else we have? Um, I'm not sure. seeing anybody else who did a comment on the chat function. Uh, I don't see anybody that did anything on the chat function. I just see phone numbers. So can you identify yourself, someone ending uh, phone number 9579? That's me. I kept leaving in the... Um, oh, is it Caitlin? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry. Okay, that's, that's good. <laughs> How about uh, 0029? I think that might be Liza. Yep, that's me. Thanks. Are you trying to come in as a board member and a member of the public? <laughs> <laughs> Just yeah, check it. Right? No? Okay. <laughs> How about uh, ending in 0020? Again, ending in 0020. Any comment? Hmm. I don't think we have anything there, but if they chime in, I'm sure we'll start to hear. Other than that, I do not see anybody else from the public at this time. Okay, great. Thank you. And then I guess we will go to our next agenda item, which is personnel. So uh, Dr. Bass and Larry Prince, I will turn it over to you. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Larry will, will run us through. I'll make comments on uh, many of the people that I had the opportunity to, to uh, interact with. Um, and again, as I said earlier, we're just really pleased with the quality of people that are coming forward. But go ahead, Larry. Thank you, Dr. Bass. Um, so in, first of all, we have some professional leaves of absence that I'd like to bring forward. These are people who are taking a leave or a partial leave from their existing position in the district to take other positions in the district. They're taking a leave of absence in order that they're guaranteed to at least be able to return to their position next year in the event that position now uh, does not go forward. So uh, Gabe Cohen is a music teacher. He's taking a 20% leave to become the uh, performing arts coordinator. Rob Fogg uh, is requesting a leave of absence from 40% of his position as a music teacher to be a 100% uh, position at Beaver Middle School. Um, Sarah Hans uh, is taking a 60% leave from her current position as a special ed teacher at Concord High. 
in order to assume the role of a 60% intern coordinator. Uh, Philip Close, Clint Close, uh, is taking a leave of absence from his Beaver Meadow music teaching position to be the theater and film teacher at CRTC. Um, is Carol, McCarthy, Carol McCarthy is taking a leave from her teaching position to be the assistant principal at Kristen McAuliffe. Michelle Mulligan is taking a leave of absence from her CEA position to be the uh, project key or the enrichment teacher kindergarten. And Laura Beth Alwick is taking a leave of absence from her special ed teaching position to be the assistant principal at Abbott Downing. Great, thank you, Larry. Do board members have questions about any of the leaves of absence? Uh, seeing none, is there a motion to approve the leaves of absence? Okay, so Gina has moved I'll that. Second. Is there a second? I'll second it. And I think that was Tom. Is that right? Great. Thank you. Um, so it's been moved and seconded. Any discussion on the leaves of absence? So I'll call the roll to um, to vote on that. Uh, Ms. Cannon. Ms. Cannon, I didn't hear your vote. Aye. Great, thank you. Uh, Mr. Curdo? Aye. Thank you, Mr. Curdo. Mr. Crush? Aye. Thank you, Mr. Crush. Ms. Higgins? I believe Ms. Higgins has left the meeting. Um, uh, Mr. Parker? Aye. Thank you, Mr. Parker. Ms. Poignier? Aye. Thanks, Ms. Poignier. Uh, Mr. Richards? Aye. Thank you, Mr. Richards. Uh, Ms. Smith? Aye. Thank you, Ms. Smith. And the chair votes aye. So the professional leaves are approved by a vote of eight to zero. Thank you. Next, we have some administrator uh, nominations. These folks are returning to their existing positions. Uh, some are one year only. Um, I'll go through that. So Kyleen Shulaskis uh, has been uh, recommended for an assistant principal position at the high school, replacing Tom Kremrine, who returned to a CEA position. Uh, she will have a salary of one thirteen three forty five. Laura Beth Elwerk, as you just approved her personal leave to assume this assistant principal leave at the elementary school at Abbott Downing. Uh, so she is returning. She's at one hundred and ten seven. 110,762. Nancy Pender, uh, the, as the assistant principal at Broken Ground, she had earlier submitted her uh, letter of resignation and then uh, requested to rescind that. She didn't want to leave the district in the, the state that uh, we're all in, so she's agreed to come back uh, in the capacity uh, as assistant principal. So we're happy to have her back. And that would be at a salary of 111. 425. And Carol McCarthy, who just, uh, you approved the leave of absence from her teaching position to take the, uh, to return to the assistant principal position at Crystal McAuliffe at a salary of 111425. Great. Thank you, Larry. Um, are there any questions on the CAA um, nominations? And again, all this material is in the board book. That's why I'm trying to go back and forth and look at it, but um, it is all there. Okay, seeing no questions, is there a motion to approve um, the new CAA nominations? I would make that motion. And that I was will Tom Curdo? I will yes. second the motion. So moved by Tom, seconded by Chuck. Is there any discussion on the CAA nominations? So seeing none, I will call the roll on Ms. Cannon. Aye. Thanks, Ms. Cannon. Mr. Curdo? Aye. Thanks, Mr. Curdo. Uh, Mr. Crush? Aye. Thanks, Mr. Crush. Ms. Higgins has left. Uh, Mr. Parker? Aye. Thank you, Mr. Parker. Ms. Poignier? Aye. Thanks. Ms. Poignier, Mr. Richards? Aye. 
Thanks, Mr. Richards. Ms. Smith? Aye. Thanks, Ms. Smith. And the chair votes aye. So the CAA nominations are approved by a vote of eight to nothing. Thank you. Now I have some uh, CEA nominations. The first batch I'll read to you are for existing staff members. Most of them are these one year only uh, folks that we went over earlier. And then I'll go over the list of new teachers to the district and I'll let you know when I cross over into that. Uh, so existing staff, Gabe Cohen, 20% uh, of performing arts coordinator position. That's a uh, one year only position. Most of these are at 20%. So his uh, salary for this 20% is 17661 Bryn Cowett, music teacher at the high school, 20%, one year only at 12605 Robert Fogg, music teacher at Beaver Meadow, one year only. Uh, this is the uh, step 10 of the bachelor's track, 68196 Mary Palm is a school nurse at the high school who uh, has applied for and been selected as the nurse at Beaver Meadow. Uh, this is a rate of 63,672. Michelle Pratt, classroom teacher at Beaver Meadow. This is a new position. Uh, she's at 47,548. Robert Couturier, uh, Crystal McCullough School, music teacher, one year only position at 40%. He's replacing Robert Fogg at uh, 31,489. Matt Finney, uh, who was a teacher at um, Broken Ground uh, is becoming a physical edu education teacher at Millbrook, uh, 77,687. Janine LaChapelle, we're adding 40% to her 60% uh, position as the hearing teacher. <clears throat> Excuse me, this 40% is at a rate of 35,322. Michelle Mulligan, the uh, kindergarten uh, enrichment teacher, this is an annual position, one year only, at 77,687. Now, the following folks are new to Concord School District, and I think these are the ones that Frank was uh, talking about. Uh, he, he and Donna have interviewed them all and uh, very, very impressed with the quality that we have. Uh, Jill, excuse me, Jill St. Laurent, school counselor at Concord Hall. Hang, hang on, hang on, Larry. Was someone wanting to speak? Yes, I'm sorry. It's Lyndon. Larry, um, I also have in the materials that I received from you and I'm not sure you covered these two people, Melissa Loof and Heidi Vibert. Did you speak to those? And uh, oh, hold on, Lyndon. Let me just make sure that I... No, I did not. I don't have them on the sheet that I have here. I apologize for that. Do you have them there, Lyndon? Can you read them? Yes, actually, I could read them. I don't if, know. If, but... the, if the board doesn't mind. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yep, Lyndon, go ahead. Okay, Melissa Loof, ELL teacher, Concord High School, uh, 55,285 B5. She's currently an 80% ELL teacher at Concord High. Um, and she, it was budgeted at 88,304. Larry, do I need to say anything else than that? No, just her current rate, whatever that would be, is current salary? Um, 55,285. Okay. Uh, and then Heidi Vibert, special ed teacher at Abbott Downing, 57,220. Um, one year only, she replaces Laura Beth Ulwick, uh, who is on a leave of absence from CEA to accept the CAA position one year only. Right. Thank you very okay. much, Lyndon. I appreciate that. <clears throat> so, so, so Larry and yes. Lyndon, just to be clear, so those were not in the board packet, um, but they will be published. They should have been in the board packet. I'm okay. looking at it right now, but this, this is they, are they, the they, they are in the board packet. They are in the board packet. Oh, okay, okay. I'm, I'm skipping the board packet. I, what I do is I print them out, and I did not have those two, so I apologize for that. Okay, got it. Now we okay. have so the next ones that I talk about are new to Concord. Uh, Jill St. Laurent is a school counselor at Concord High. She comes in at step 14 of the master's track at 85605. Jessica Heath, the classroom teacher at Crystal McCullough. Uh, she's a B1, and that's at 44,984. Timothy Latour, a physical education teacher at Crystal McCullough, at a salary of 85,605. Taylor McArdle, classroom teacher at Millbrook School, the annual salary of 54,611. Amanda Black Ingersoll, special ed teacher at Concord High, 
uh, B1, 44,984. Joshua Harwood, a business teacher at Concord High, at 57,310. Megan Williamson, classroom teacher at Beaver Meadow, at a salary of 70,085. And Aislinn Alfonso, a classroom teacher at Millbrook School, at 44,984, which is a step one of the bachelor's track. Right. Yeah, and as Larry said, you know, we had a, we we interviewed these people, and I talked to all the principals about them before I interviewed them, and I got to tell you, these these are really really great hires, really great hires. So we're we're tickled pink with the quality that's coming in. Great, thank you, Dr. Bass, and board members. Any questions about um, any of these CEA nominations? Um, I don't have any questions about the nominations, but I would like to follow up on something we talked about in late winter. Um, Dr. Bass, I can't remember the name of the gentleman that you brought in to talk about diversifying the workforce in the district. Um, can you just let us know if any of that was able to be implemented or if things were Yeah, no, you're talking, yeah, talking about Michael Worsley. Uh, no, we really weren't able to do much because, uh, you know, the remote learning kind of put a stop to that. Uh, some people have to try and pick up, uh, you know, to get back in school for, for next fall. Uh, so I'll make sure to uh, have him come back and uh, meet with the new superintendent. And obviously, I know Mike Reardon is really excited about working with him uh, and wants to get moving on that. But uh, I think with the remote learning uh, issue and the whole, you know, pandemic, uh, we kind of put that on the back burner. Okay. Thanks for the update. Yeah. Great. Liza, thanks for asking. Good to keep us reminded. Okay, so I think I uh, didn't see any other questions from board members. So is there a motion to approve the uh, CEA nominations that Larry just went through? Jenny, I'll move that we approve the nominations, please. Great. Thank you, Jim. Is there a second? Tom, was that you seconding? It was. Great. Thank you, Tom. Um, any discussion? So seeing none, I will call the roll. Uh, Ms. Cannon? Aye. Thank you, Ms. Cannon. Um, Mr. Croto? Aye. Thank you, Mr. Croto. Mr. Crush? Aye. Thank you, Mr. Crush. Um, Mr. Parker? Aye. Thank you, Mr. Parker. Ms. Poignier? Aye. Thanks, Ms. Poignier. Mr. Richards? Aye. Thank you, Mr. Richards. Ms. Smith? Aye. Thank you, Ms. Smith. And the chair votes aye. So those are approved on a vote of 8 to nothing. Thank you. And the last item on the personnel agenda is the annual request that the board give the district administration the authority to hire during the summer months. And then we would bring your the, the uh, candidate uh, to the board for the uh, confirmation approval. This will allow us to offer folks contracts as we speak, and uh, so that that they won't have to wait uh, till the next June meeting uh, to uh, get, enter into a contract with with our district. Uh, so we do respectfully request that the board give us permission to hire during the summer months, and essentially that would be uh, from where we are now through August. Great. Thank you, Larry. And um, as the, you know, the older board members know, this is something that we do every year, um, but we certainly can have a conversation about why we do it and whether there's any reason to modify that practice. So um, I guess I'm wondering, do the new board members have any questions about it? Um, again, typically it has given the flexibility to just move forward quickly with some of these great folks that, um, as Dr. Bass said, we are, um, are meeting with. Um, I, can I, Jenny, I have a question. I, I, yes, totally support, ahead, I totally support doing this, but my question is to Larry, do we have our vacancies compared to each year it, it, about where we are each time of the year? Are we about at the same pace we are annually each as far as vacancies? Yes, this actually, Chuck, this has been a good year for us. We do have quite a few vacancies, but we have filled quite a bit, as, as you can tell by the list they yeah, gave. Yep. And my sense is that uh, in the June meeting, we'll have many more for you. So we're moving fast and furious. We're getting good applicants. Uh, principals are, are, you know, interviewing. 
Uh, so there's been quite a bit of movement. Uh, I feel good that where 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 we are actually. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, I'll support you know giving you giving the district of the authority to hire over the summer. Thank you. Um, any other questions? <clears throat> yeah, I have one question for Larry. Larry, are you seeing any trends in employment or just? overall demographics with regard to hiring? Well, I can tell you that this, this uh, bunch that we've just uh, brought to you today are much more experienced than we typically are used to. Uh, there aren't a whole lot of, you know, B1s, although we do we do have some B1s, uh, you know, on the bottom of the bachelor's trail, so new teachers, I guess. So we're seeing less of those, but I'm not sure that will be the trend in the next few months, but that's probably the most glaring thing I see. Most folks are, are highly qualified and come with a lot of experience. Yeah, if I could add to that, Dave, that's actually an interesting question. I, I think, you know, part of this is the fact that we've been in the newspaper a lot and in a very positive way, uh, also on Channel 9 a lot in a very positive way. And then you couple that with the networking that's been going on between principals and, and senior administrators. And so folks are saying, hey, I may be Concord would be a good place for me to work. So you're getting a lot of people looking at Concord where they perhaps might not have in the past. And I think that's why you're seeing a lot of veterans coming in, uh, applying for these positions. And as I said earlier, we're really pleased with the quality we're getting. I, I would suspect that we're going to have maybe a couple, I mean, less than a handful to deal with over the summer. They're still coming in, so we're, we feel confident that we're going to be able to, to hire the bulk of all of our people by the time the June meeting comes around. Great. Thank you, Dr. Bass. Um, other questions or comments on this issue before we ask for a motion? So, seeing none, is there a motion to... Um, give district administrators authority to hire over the summer months subject to approval by the board um, at the subsequent meeting. I'll make the motion. Yeah, sure. So I make the motion to allow the uh, board, admi the administration hire over the summer months uh, subject to approval at the June meeting, but to go ahead and issue contracts uh, at their discretion during the summer months. Great. Thank you, Chuck. Is there a second? I will second it. Okay. So moved by Chuck, seconded by Tom. Is there any discussion? Yes, I'd like to ask a question. Yep, Gina, go ahead. We had spoken um, when we voted on the budget about asking the administration not to fill all of the positions or certain positions and that we would readdress that at this meeting tonight um, about having the, the positions uh, earmarked in the budget but not necessarily filling them in light of what's going on economically and in light also of perhaps those positions are not where the new superintendent's um, priorities were. Yeah, I just wonder. Oh, no, that's a good point. We haven't hired those positions yet. Um, this is the, the prime time to do that. So my only caveat is, is if we hold back and we wait until either the new superintendent comes on or want to just wait and see how things play out, we're going to lose the opportunity of getting really good quality candidates. Once June hits, if we haven't advertised, most everybody else is going to be under contract. And once they're under contract, they're, they're not going to be able to apply for any positions with us. Right, but that's the, the very conversation we had last time, and everyone said, well, no, don't worry about it. We can always just hold off on that. And, and so now I'm hearing we can't hold off on that. Yeah, my, my, I'm, I don't recall the specificity, uh, and if we said that, then, you know, I apologize. Um, clearly the issue for us is, you know, we have a window till about June to be able to hire folks. And again, as I say, after that, they are under contract with whatever district they happen to be at, and it's very, very difficult for them to break that contract. For us to advertise for somebody in, you know, July, August, September, 
it's very difficult to find anybody of really good quality who's going to be out there to, to, to come into the position. So it, it leaves us with slim pickings, to, to put it bluntly. So, I mean, I was hoping we would have this discussion. So thank you for asking the question, Gina. And I think it's appropriate to think about it as we, as we vote on this authorization. I guess the question is, um, is there, do we have any further clarity um, than we did on April 23rd when we voted in terms of um, kind of the nature of the positions moving forward? Do we have a really clear idea of what we want to advertise for? Is there any ambiguity um, or anything, that's a, that's any other good. thoughts on that? Yeah, we did. So Don and I spent a lot of time. We talked to all the principals about what we thought might make the most sense given them the three positions the three new positions that you gave us and so we actually came up with i think uh, one special ed position at millbrook one special ed position at beaver brook beaver uh, i'm sorry broken ground at broken ground and then um a half social worker position at um uh, krista mcauliffe and i'm sorry yeah yeah half social worker at krista mcauliffe and then uh, for uh, uh Abbott Downing, a half school psychologist position. Just so folks know, the half social worker will marry the other half social worker that was already in the budget. So that gives uh, Chris Gallo a full full time social worker. Uh, what Anthony is trying to do at Abbott Downing is to um, kind of have it both ways. He wants a half time social worker and a half time school psychologist based on the needs of his building. Uh, for those who are interested, that was a very long, debatable conversation that we had with him and his staff about this. Um, this is where he would like to go, and so I deferred to his judgment to go ahead and do that. Uh, it does sort of throw caution in the wind because, again, you're looking at half-time positions, which aren't always that easy to find, but he still, he and Laura Beth still felt very strongly that was the best way to suit the particular issues he was dealing with in his building. And, you know, I want to defer to principals when I can. Okay, thank you. So the plan right now is to go ahead and advertise those positions, but they haven't been advertised yet. Is that right? Or um, just in the process of advertising now. Okay, great. So these are the positions that we said, go ahead and earmark the funding, but don't hire yet. That's correct. So now we're hiring. Well, we haven't hired yet. I mean, as I said, uh, we I mean, haven't in, haven't interviewed people yet. But we no, are, that's, no, that's, that's the plan. We've not even received any applications yet. But that's the plan. Yes. Okay. I understand. I mean, I want to make sure folks are comfortable with that. If you want us not to do that, I can do that. But I just want to be clear that if I do, then you know, I, I put the buildings at risk in terms of being able to have that position available, and then. If the board says in June or July or August, go ahead and, and advertise for the position, uh, I'm just not going to have a whole lot of, of, of good people to go to. Yeah, Dr. Bass, this is Dave Parker. Yep. Yeah, I, I understand all that argument. We did have that discussion, though, and these are somewhat additional positions um, that we're adding. And... We're giving you permission to do this over the summer. I mean, we had a long discussion as to whether or not um, this was the appropriate way to go um, for the taxpayers um, and, you know, for the district. We were really sort of ambivalent. And, again, I, I'm sh I have a lot of respect for the principals and what they need and who they need. But we had this discussion. And to Gina's point, it can't be completely ignored um, that we have concerns about adding additional staff um, sort of slid in over the summer or in the next month or so, even though we question the um, judgment on that. Uh, yes, yeah, so again, I, I'm not trying to ignore the point. I, as I said, we have not um, had any applications yet. We've not done any interviewing. I'm only cautioning you that if I don't do this, then I won't have great applicants. If the board wants me not to do this, that's fine. I just need to know that, and we, we will hold back. 
But I just want to make it clear to you all what the ramifications are. I mean, it's a plus and minus issue. So it's entirely up to you how you want to, you know, move forward with this. And I'm, 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 I'm not really comfortable, but if that's the way you want to go, certainly we can do that. I'm not so asking. Dr. Go ahead. Now, Dr. Bats is Chuck. Uh, so question. So you're not comfortable with waiting due to the, the, the needs of, of the schools as stated by the principals that you support, correct? Yes. Okay. So, and these positions are already in the budget, correct? Yes. So in my mind, uh, from my perspective, uh, and I, know, I recall the discussion we had, but, but if, if our, our district leadership is telling us that we're putting schools and children at risk and we may not be able to fill those positions and it may not be the optimal outcome for those kids or those students, and the faculty, then I'm not comfortable waiting. So I'm trying to figure out from a procedural perspective the best way to do this. And here's the idea that I have. Um, I think we want to separate out the authority to hire over the summer month for all of the ordinary course positions. And it seems that, it, yeah, we haven't taken a vote yet, but that there's a will to do that as we always have in the past. And that the only question is respect with respect to these three brand new positions that we talked about on April 13th. So maybe we should hold a separate vote on those two. We, we could hold a vote on the authorization to hire over the summer months for all but those three positions and then hold a separate vote on authorization to hire um, for these three positions. And if that, you know, if that authorization is not given, then the result would be that we could advertise for them, but they would not be hired until the board had approved them. Well, yeah. Well, the last part of if I advertise for them, uh, those people aren't going to wait. So, I mean, I, I guess what I'm saying is the board would need to let me know one way or the other tonight uh, what you want to do, um, because I couldn't I couldn't bring them in, interview them and say, well, I have to wait, you know, 20 days or 30 days for the board to give us approval to hire you. They're going to say, that's OK. Thank you very much. I'm going to go back to where I came from. So I just be leery about that. And again, whatever the board wants to do is fine. I just need to know. Well, I think why don't we put it to a vote because then we'll know and we'll have a decision on, on you know whether or not there should be hiring for those three positions. Um, so, is there someone who wants to make a motion? Sure, I'll make the motion. I make the motion that we give the administration authority to go ahead and hire for those three positions, uh, follow the usual practices and protocols that they follow in hiring uh, for any other professional position. Okay, great. Thank you, Chuck. Is there a second? Second. It's Liza. Okay. Um, and is there any further discussion on the motion? Yes, I would love, you know, I, I, I differ from, from, from uh, Mr. Questions that we're, by not hiring these people, we're going to put students at great risk. Um, I would never want to put anyone at great risk, including the Concord School District. The question that I had was that we're adding positions that after adding positions last year, when we came under great scrutiny by the public. Uh, and so I'm just raising the questions. I'm not saying that I necessarily believe that we shouldn't hire some of these people. I have to raise the question because I represent the taxpayers. So thank you. Yep. No, thank you, Dave. Um, any other discussion? Um, and it is, it's a hard question. I just, I think we have to put it to a vote because otherwise we won't give clear direction to the administration. Jen, yes, I do Tom, have one question. Yeah. yeah, Tom, go ahead. So help me if you would remember exactly what our, our contention was. I think, I think it was because we were concerned about the number of positions and the financial impact 
Um, and that was the reason that we held back on these positions. Is that correct? I think that it came up during our budget discussion uh, as to whether there was a way that we could, you know, we, what we, we were trying to choose between option A and option B. We chose, if there seems to be a clear will for option A. There was a concern about whether we could go even farther without basically um, undermining the confidence that the administration had expressed in coming up with option A, that it would not be harmful to the educational services being provided in the district. And I think we talked about, you know, really not knowing and not having the expertise to know, um, you know, how we might be able to, um, you know, further relieve any burden on the taxpayer. And so one of the things that was discussed was whether we could vote in these positions and then, and then not fill them. Um, and so that was the context of the discussion, and I think it was a good discussion. I guess one piece of information that we didn't get into during the updates but might be helpful here is um, in looking at ways to give relief to the taxpayers, certainly our work on that will not be limited to how we approach these positions. And I know that Jack has talked about scheduling a special meeting and that you as chair of the finance committee have talked about, you know, looking at where is, where are we in the budget and looking at, at that in June. So I think regardless of how we end up voting on this particular motion, we will be very diligently looking at ways to um, relieve the burden on the taxpayer. And I don't know, there may be further information even that's relevant to this discussion and this vote that Dr. Bass or Jack could author. I don't know if that's helpful, Tom. Well, it is, Jen. And I, I guess spurs another question, and that is these positions are already in the budget financially. Um, but I don't want to feel like we're misleading the public in any way, shape, or form by saying, you know, we passed our budget previous to this, and and even though these positions were financially included, we hadn't really included them, and now we're going to, you know, some weeks later. I'm just wondering how how that plays out with hope. If uh, and then the educational part of it is it's a no brainer, and I appreciate Dr. Bass's getting the input from the building principles because that's frankly what that's what we asked him to do and he did and he got his answers and he wants to move forward so i have no no issue whatsoever with that I'm just wondering how how it plays out um, so i i'm going to ask jack is it is guaranteed we already have those positions in our budget yes they you have passed a budget that has all those positions. Okay. So you will be raising taxes based on those positions, correct? And and but that was what we had previously uh, told the the public, um, and this is not a surprise. Thank you. So thank you, Tom, and, and I. You know, just my comment um, for purposes of this motion is. I, I will vote in favor of this motion. I do think that we had a good discussion when we talked about the budget. I think it was appropriate to raise this question and to think about, you know, how do we proceed here? But for me personally, my confidence in option A really rests on the fact that it was recommended by the administration and that in a sense, I don't think that I have the expertise to subtract positions. So I think if, since we did, vote the budget with these positions, we should go ahead and let the administration hire them and while still continuing to work diligently to find other ways to relieve the burden on the taxpayers and otherwise to be responsible with respect to the decisions that we make going forward. But that is the vote that, the, you know, the, the budget that we adopted. Jenny. Yep. Jim. Yep. Um, as I remember this, though, this was a discussion, and this was add-on positions from option A. We added these back in, and we did it based on the fact that we really did not know 
um, what our needs would be at that time. It was very, very early in this, uh, in this epidemic. And, um, and we know, as Jack had counseled us as if we did not include them, there was no way to add that back in very easily. So we put it in there with, uh, as, as more of a contingency type of a position. Now, personally, I don't feel like I know any more now on, than I did before with regards to, you know, what the financial effects are going to be. And these are an additional position over, these positions do not exist right now. And we will still be raising taxes. So I still have some concerns on that. And, um, but I just wanted to voice us has, I remembered it during our budget discussion. And again, I remember it differently. So I think I'm going to ask Jack to clarify because as I recollect, these were positions that were included originally in option A when it was presented by the administration. And then based on concerns that were expressed during the first budget hearing, the administration came up with option B that added in some additional positions beyond these three. Um, and that these particular three were not add-ons to option A. They actually were part of option A as it was originally presented. But I'd like to have Jack speak to that so that we can make sure that we're on the same page factually. I think if I understood it right, that, that is correct. I am uh, in the process of loading up the PowerPoint from the budget that you passed with option A to list all the positions. But... Uh, originally, yes, there were five positions. It was lowered to three, and they are the three positions that were passed. They are in the budget, and that is what the tax rate was is uh, to be determined off of. Yep, Jim. Okay, thank you, uh, thank you, Jack. I stand corrected. Well, uh, can I speak? Yes, Dave. Go ahead. Yeah, I It is my understanding that we did add those positions. Um, it was very, and it was very easy for us to move from Plan B to Plan A without putting um, all these students at risk. We had planned on a large number of additional staff, and no one complained that. that we were putting all these students at risk when we went from B to A. And I'm really in favor of having these positions, but the process we're going through, we don't even understand right now. Jenny, you feel one way. We're asking, did we do it this way or did we do it that way? This is really not particularly comfortable for me because we don't know what we're doing. So, yeah, I, I have a problem with this as a taxpayer and it seems like if they ask for it we'll give it to them unless we don't but, but and then we say we're going to put students at risk I don't want to put anyone at risk but this is not the way we should be going about adding positions when we don't know what we're doing so so let me add some clarity here I think you know let's go back to the very, very beginning so when we first came before the board we had a budget that had I want to say 22 additional positions we had all kinds of great and wonderful things, and we made a lot of creative explanations as to how these were all going to transform the district, and it was great. Then the pandemic hit, and then we all realized that, oh, my God, there's no way we can go forward with this. We scaled everything back. We scaled it back to what was option A. We came back to the board with that option A very scaled down. Some board members said, well, maybe you've gone too far. Maybe you might want to think about some additional positions to which you've already carved out. And we, we came, to Dave's point, when we came to you with option A, we scaled it all back. We said very clearly, no one is at risk. So option A was a non-risk situation. Uh, and then the board said, well, can you go back and think about maybe adding some positions back to that? We did. And then we came up, I think there was some, also some conversation about two, you know, three or four of this or two of that, but we settled on an option B. We actually came back, because you had said, Jenny, let's just have two options, A and B. We'll line them up. Let's have the discussion and see where we're at. That's what we did. So option B had additional positions in it. The board voted pretty clearly to go with option A. 
But option A had that first scale down uh, proposal that we had gave that had of the three positions that we're talking about already baked in. So they were never afterthoughts. They were always part of option A. So I'd like to speak to that because I actually asked whether we could have a budget or an option C that didn't have them at all. And I was told no, which is one of the reasons why I brought this whole thing up about having those as and, and was clearly told we could put those in the budget and kind of put a pin in it and come back around and decide whether or not we wanted those. Those were the wishes of the elementary schools. Those, th because it started out with that those were going to be special education teachers. And then all of a sudden they became a social worker and a psychologist. It became things that were not initially part of the discussion, which was special education teachers. So I, I don't, I, I, I'm sorry, but I disagree with the characterization. Yeah, but you're going back to a previous conversation. So before we got to option A, we had a conversation about five special ed positions. And then we came before the board and we said, well, actually, we don't want to look just at special ed. And we had the principals come forward and each one spoke differently about what they wanted. One wanted a psychologist, one wanted a social worker, and I think two wanted special ed. And that's where all of that came, that conversation came from. Um, so that, that's where that was. And then we got into option A, it boiled down to, I think at the time, three special ed positions. And then after that meeting left, then I started talking to folks about, so is that what we want, three special ed positions? And then the conversation moved, and then it was like, all right, two special ed positions, but where we originally had put them, I think we moved, and so now we went to Millbrook and to, to Beaver, to Broken Ground, and then we added up, ended up with a split at uh, uh, Krista McAuliffe and, and Abbott Downing. Back to your point, Gina, you're right. When we talked about option C, and I went to Jenny and said, no, let's just have option A and option B. So only had the two to really choose from. Then we got to the issue of what you had brought up. Well, oh, can we hold back on these positions? Don't hire them because maybe the new superintendent might want to have a different position on that, and maybe we as a board and an administration might feel differently. So we did not hire them, but I certainly made preparations to do so because I wanted to be in a position to be able to get the best people I could in the time that I had in front of me. So, I mean, that, that's where I'm coming from in all of this. And again, my preference would be to go ahead and hire the positions. But, you know, if the board does not want to do that, I understand that. I see where the board's coming from. And, and, and that's the board's wishes. And we will certainly glad to, to follow through on that. I think this, this conversation is beneficial because it, it is. It was confusing, and I think, you know, let's sort it out. Again, as I said before, my recollection is the same as Dr. Bass's, which is this: these three positions were in option A. They were there all along. That was, I guess, in my sense, the floor of what was being recommended by the administration. As we discussed it, we talked about whether there might be a possibility to proceed as Gina has, has talked about, but um, but these always were part of kind of the floor recommendation for option A. Um, so there, there certainly was that discussion about, well, we have these three positions, might they be filled differently at different schools? But as Dr. Bass says, I think that was a separate a separate conversation, but that was you know still part of this core option A recommendation. Yeah, one more point if I could. I mean, I, I don't disagree with Dave's point. I really don't. I mean, in some respects, it, it almost appears if you're looking at this from the outside, looking in, it's like, are you guys playing ring around the rosy? I mean, every time we turn around, it's, it's a new variation of what you're doing. First you got special ed, then you don't have special ed. And it all goes back to this whole issue of the, the Bill White issue versus the special ed issue versus the assistant principal issue. And so that's why I think the whole Nate Levinson thing is a good thing because you can finally kind of striate all those things out and say where what things belong with what things and how do we best go forward. But obviously that's that's a conversation for another time. But I'm just saying I, I see his point, and I think from someone looking on the outside, they're probably going to say the same thing. Well, there's, can I speak for a second again? We're, yeah, Dave, go ahead. We're working on some history here where we where we took some – some teachers off the front lines and we added a bunch of administrators as we go back over the past year. And then, you know, we, we questioned, you know, we went from option B to option A, not entirely because of the 
the vi- the virus. I'm sort of sick of making decisions based on the virus because I think things are going to change. I believe we made the decision because once we make those decisions, we're obligated to to a position that we will pay for for many years, not just in this budget. And so we were scrutinizing it to some degree and said, hey, I don't know. Um, and I agree with Dr. Bass that, yeah, this is the best time to hire people. I don't believe that you can't hire good people in different on different threads. Conk is a great district. People would look at the job. You may not get the best, but we're going to be obligated to these positions regardless of what happens. And that's how I recall it. And, and they were more administrative, again, not putting people on the line. At the same time, we're asking, we're, we're contemplating reviewing our whole student services. And so we're plugging in positions when at the same time we're questioning how we're delivering our student services. It just seems just a little crazy to me. Sorry. You know, who's, who's driving the ship? And I, to all, with all due respect to Dr. Bass and, and the administration, it's really pretty confusing to me. Okay. Jenny. Thank you, Dave. Yep, Jim, go ahead. So, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Jack for putting this slide and bringing it back up because it really clarifies quite a bit of um, where we stand on these. Um, and as I look through this and I go through the slide, uh, I I agree, and I agree, um, I think, with you on the benefits of this discussion, but I feel just want to say at this point I feel fairly comfortable going forward with those three positions. Great. Thank you, Jim. So I think I'm getting ready to call the vote here unless anybody wants to speak. Let's let's move forward with this. Any other discussion on the motion? So let me repeat the motion. The motion was made by Chuck, seconded by Liza to move forward with hiring for these three positions um, that were approved as part of the budget, consistent with the hiring process for for all other positions. Jenny, so, uh, I think wasn't his motion was not only that, that but, but all of the summer positions, including these three positions. And Chuck, don't let me put words in your mouth. Well, I was. I think we're separating it out as as a separate motion, and then we're I thought we were it. separating it out yeah. too. That was my understanding. Yeah. So then that is fine. So that was how I wrote it down. Let's move with that as the motion, and then we'll then we can have a motion on that as well. I guess that was pen, was that pending. Okay. So that motion was pending. That was also moved by Chuck, seconded by Tom. So maybe we need to suspend that motion. Um, gosh, I need to get my Robert's rules, but. Um, why can't we leave the. Uh, the original motion, um, and and take care of it se- separately and secondly. Yes. Okay. If you're if you're willing, maybe Chuck, can you withdraw the motion that you had made on the authority for summer hires? Sure. And, I will. Yes. I will make. A, do I need to make a motion to withdraw the motion? No. Just maybe just withdraw it if, if it's okay All with right. Tom. Yeah, I, I would draw the motion I made regarding uh, authorizing the administration to. Uh, have the authority to uh, hire the uh, summer vacancies at their discretion. I withdraw that motion. Okay. And Tom, as a second, agrees to withdrawing that? I do. Okay. Thank you, Tom. So now the motion that, what it, maybe, Chuck, do you want to re- remake the motion that we're considering? Um, sure, sure. I'm going to have to start writing down my motions. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah. So I will uh, I will make the motion that we proceed with the three positions um, that were proposed by the administration that's in the uh, budget uh, that we give them the permission to go ahead and hire those positions per our uh, policies and procedures for all professional positions. Great, thank you. And I think that was it. Yeah. I think that was it. Yeah. And Liza, yeah. you'd seconded it. Do you want to second it again? Yes, I'll second. Okay. Great. So I will now call the roll on that motion. Um, Ms. Cannon. May. Thank you, Ms. Thank Cannon. You, Mr. Croto. 
Aye. Thank you, Mr. Crudo. Mr. Crush. Aye. Thank you, Mr. Crush. Ms. Higgins has left the meeting. Uh, Mr. Parker. Nay. Okay, thank you, Mr. Parker. Ms. Poinier. Aye. Thank you, Ms. Poinier. Uh, Mr. Richards. Aye. Thank you, Mr. Richards. Uh, Ms. Smith. Aye. Thank you, Ms. Smith. And the chair votes aye. So the motion passes one, two, three, four, five, six to two with Ms. Cannon and Mr. Parker voting nay. Everyone else in favor. So now I will entertain a motion um, on the request to give authority to hire for the summer months. Does I someone will want to make that motion? Yeah. Yeah, I will again make the motion uh, to grant the administration the authority to hire for positions for the summer months uh, per our policies and procedures regarding that. And, we're, and I think they report that information at the June uh, board meeting. And I will again second it. Great. Thank you. So the motion is by Chuck, seconded by Tom, to give the administration authority over the summer months to hire subject to confirmation by the board after the fact. Um, any discussion now on that motion? Seeing none, I will call the roll on that motion. Um, sorry, I didn't have enough checklists here. Um, Ms. Cannon. Aye. Um, thank you, Ms. Cannon. Uh, Mr. Crodo. Aye. Thank you, Mr. Crodo. Mr. Crush. Aye. Thank you, Mr. Crush. Mr. Parker. Aye. Thank you, Mr. Parker. Ms. Poignier. Aye. Thank you, Ms. Poignier. Uh, Mr. Richards. Aye. Thank you, Mr. Richards. Ms. Smith. Aye. Thank you, Ms. Smith. And the chair votes aye, so that motion is approved eight to nothing. And is there anything else under personnel? Uh, no, that's it. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Okay, moving right along, our next agenda item is the superintendent search update. And Tom, I'm going to go to you. Let me just do a quick recap first, if that's okay. Is that okay? It is, absolutely. Because okay. um, I'll try to make it super quick. Um, so back in January, we had a process that was really solid. We were working with NESDEC. We put the process out there. We had great preliminary public um, participation. We had a survey. We had focus groups. Um, then we had Tom, Jack, and Danielle who worked to convene and lead a very robust steering committee which diligently reviewed applicants. They had a vigorous discussion. They went through the screening and then COVID-19 hit, which kind of threw everything sideways. The screening committee nevertheless persevered. They went forward um, with interviews on a remote basis. Um, they had candidates that they forwarded to the board. Um, and so the process now rests with the board. And I think under the process that we had originally contemplated, we would immediately be going forward with the candidates, um, making them public, having the robust public vetting, and then having a final board decision. And we had originally contemplated that we would have made that decision actually at the April meeting, I think. And you know, obviously, we've slowed everything down pretty substantially. I think one of the things that's been challenging, and we've had some, some meetings and discussions, it's reflected in the minutes that we approved already, um, how exactly do we move forward with this process with the same degree of robust public participation and involvement that we had planned? Um, and then also, how do we take into account the considerations with respect to our candidates who are now responding to the COVID situation in their own districts? So I think where things stand right now is we are absolutely committed to the same robust public participation process, um, but we have slowed things down a bit and we've prolonged 
the confidential phase a little longer than we had originally contemplated just so we could have conversations with our candidates about you know how to move forward in this in this context um, so that's where we are right now and I think Tom you may have some more information about a possible schedule going forward um, so I can I can turn it over to you but bottom line we're being as transparent as we can and we absolutely are committed to really having this process fully involve the public and continue um, in the vein that we started in January, even with some changes due to COVID-19. So Tom, what do you have to add here? <laughs> and well, thank was, you for all of the work you've been doing. You and Jack that, and that was pretty comprehensive, Jenny, and thanks. Um, that takes care of most of my notes, which I tend to talk a lot more, so you're, you're in good shape. Um, I think the only thing I would add to that is that uh, two things. One, yes, we do indeed absolutely um, intend to include public um, in our in our discussions once we can be assured that the board has um, candidates or a candidate to move forward, and um, and and we hope to do that um, this coming week on Wednesday, we will be um, having a non-public so that the board really can can do some in-depth questioning um, and really uh, either uh, and, and, and find out you know, what the candidate's about. So that will happen. And then uh, our hope is to get the um, one of the ideas we, we kind of talked around was how do we get the public to be able to get their input given that we're in this um, this virtual meeting type that we're in. And, and, uh, and we've got some ideas around perhaps using some of our screening committee members um, to talk to constituents that they represented while they were on the screening committee and getting input from them that we could then either bring, we could bring forward for the candidates um, in whatever fashion works for us, and it's probably going to be something along the lines with Concrete TV and Josh uh, helping us out. Um, so our hope is that we will um, be able to get a name or names soon to the public, um, and I say soon not to be a tease. We're, we're hoping that it will perhaps be this month. I, I hope the public understands too that we, we just can't go ahead and, and put names out there until those folks have contacted their districts and made it clear that they are moving or perhaps moving. So it's a very um, careful ballet that we're we're performing here, and uh, and we hope that um, it will come to a wonderful fruition very soon. Well, thank you, Tom, and thank you um, not only to to you and Danielle and Jack, but to all of the members of the screening committee who worked really, really hard under challenging circumstances to to continue to move this process forward, um, and that was really helpful. Yes. Jim, did they, you have a comment? They really did. I have to just say that, um, you know, it, it was all of a sudden the rug was pulled out from under us in that we no longer could have a face to face with folks, which was, is very comforting for anyone who has ever done any interviewing. Um, you love to have face to face conversations. This committee, um, you know, pulled themselves up by the bootstraps and and made uh, and thanks to Jack and, and Pam McLeod um, made it happen so that they could all um, chime in either from the comfort of their home or we had some very socially distanced um, spatial meetings at the uh, boardroom during that time. So it really was uh, an extraordinary effort. They did a great job. They did some good digging and um, and very satisfied with the product and the outcome. Great. Thank you, Tom. Any other comments? Sorry, here I am again, but 
Um, Go ahead, Joe. <laughs> you know, when we say, I, I read Tony Chanella's letter to the board, and um, one of the one of the observations I have is that in the past year, the board's intentions are, are never in question. You got, we're all trying to do the best things by kids. When we're saying we're doing the dance, it's suggesting that the public can't understand that, or that in some ways we can't reveal things because they're not capable of knowing this, what a dance is, and we keep it that information protected. Um, and we need to keep it protected, but the public can understand that. The public could understand if we told them this past year that we were really limited by what we could say. They can understand that. We can't continually do the dance, as Tom suggests it, without getting a lot of scrutiny. I mean, come on, guys. This is not the way it should be done. We need to explain to the public why we are doing the dance. Well, Dave, I think that's exactly what we did. I mean, that's why we had the meetings in public. That's why the minutes are in the board packet, because it's so challenging to engage with the public right now. I mean, I think for people to be able to participate in the process, and that's one of the concerns that I have about our ability to move forward, you know, hiring a superintendent right now. And I, I hope it's true that we'll be able to have the the public be fully engaged, but I think it's such a difficult conversation because it is so important to truly have an engaged public, and um, I think it's going to be hard for us to do this at this time. That's why I keep scheduling all these public meetings where we talk about it and talk about it, and I mean, I hope that people are watching because I really, I would like to get input not just on the candidates, but also on the process. Um, it's... I wish we weren't having to do it right now, but we do. I mean, you're not looking to blame, and Tom, I'm not like you guys yeah. work really, really hard. There's something that's that that seems to be missing for me here, and maybe I'm wrong. I'll, I'll admit if I'm wrong, I'm, but I'm struggling with this a little bit. I mean, I think the only thing that we is, haven't released is the actual names of the candidates that were brought forward by the screening committee, and the way, the reason that we didn't do that was just because of the sensitivity of the situations in their district right now and wanting to talk through that process. If we hadn't been in the middle of COVID-19, I think we would have already, we would have been done with this process. We would have moved forward with it. I think um, it's this, this particular piece really is challenging and it really is due to the COVID-19 situation, at least in my mind. David? My comment about dance was simply a, a metaphor to talk about how there's a need for us and for the candidates um, to, to blend their mutual needs so that we can get through this process. That's all, that's all that was. Thanks, Tom. No, I'm, I'm, I'm not disparaging you at all. That's not what my intention. My intention was to bring the issue up. And I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable with your, your answers. Thank you. Well, thank you for asking the question. I just I think it's good for us to have this conversation in public as often as we can. I mean, we've we've had meetings, and I mean, I, they're being broadcast, so I hope people are watching them on TV. But it's hard to know to what degree the public is engaged, and I do think that we have an obligation as board members to raise the questions if we're not hearing them from the public. So I appreciate you doing that. Um, Jeff, did you want to speak? No, no, I'm good. Okay. So more to come on that process. We're going to keep plugging away. Um, OK, so our next agenda item is the Negotiations Committee update. So Chuck, that is you. So <laughs> yeah, I was getting ready to speak to that. I was moving. <laughs> okay. I was reading ahead. OK, yeah, thank so, you so much. Uh, this will be a very brief report. We met April 23rd. <laughs> that was a, we had a, a non-public meeting uh, April 23rd to uh, discuss some contractual and pending uh, contractual issues. Great. Thank you, Chuck. And it's fun being the chair of that committee because you get to give those very non-substantive uh, updates. Fun, but yes. Fun yeah, I like being brief. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so the next item that we have, and I know it's getting late. Let's let's do this as quickly as we can. 
Um, so Dr. Bass gave us some background information on the eighth grade trip to DC, and I know it's an incredibly challenging situation for the parents and really, really frustrating. I think it also really presents some questions for us that are appropriately discussed at the board level. And so that's why I think Dr. Bass had asked Jack to put together some information from a financial perspective. Um, but I think there's still going to be a lot of questions that we need to ask as board members about, you know, what is our appropriate role as a, as a board and as a district in this. So I hope we can have this robust conversation at this time of night after having been going for a number of hours. So let's uh, see what we can do here. So Dr. Bass and Jack, we are Yeah, I, I, again, I, I think I, I spelled out the situation as best I can in terms of where we're at. I think Jack can now give you some of the ins and outs of how the finances would work and what are some, what he talked to the insurance company, talked to our attorney, uh, obviously both of us talked to the company to make sure we had all this straight. We didn't want to have anything and no stone left on turn, so to speak, to make sure we had everything uh, under control in terms of how this would work. So at this point, I'll turn it over to Jack. Okay. So uh, what I was expressing to Dr. Bass is if the mechanics to make this work, that we can do. Um, as far as being able to purchase those tickets, those vouchers, which are good till two, for two years, till September 30th 2022 um, and allow the parents to get reimbursed likely the amount would be nine hundred ninety nine dollars because that is the amount for the trip pre October 1 after October 1 it went to a thousand ninety nine and then you have the amount that the parents now bought. joining you had the amount that the parents purchased um, travel insurance and there were two types. There was a basic plan, and there was an what they call an any time plan. And the uh, any the basic plan was ninety nine dollars, and the any time plan was two hundred nineteen. The two hundred nineteen dollar plan did offer a full refund. The ninety nine dollar plan, based on this COVID and that being canceled, would not have refunded the parents under the terms and conditions. Um, so that you are aware of that. But if the board felt that this was important on that recommendation to reimburse these parents, get those vouchers, and use them in the next subsequent two years, we can mechanically make that happen. So in effect, though, Jack, it would be no cost to the district because you'd be buying, the, you'd be, uh, buying up the vouchers from the, this current eighth grade group, uh, less those who have the insurance and get their refund anyway then you'll be turn around and sell those vouchers to the seventh grade parents who will be eighth grade parents next year. In the event that you didn't have all 85 or so parents going on, I'm sorry, students going on the DC trip next year, you always had the luxury of the following year being able to use whatever leftover vouchers you had to be able to sell to that group. So in effect, the district would get its money back. That would be the hope that they would purchase those tickets. Yes. Oh, speaking of that, so just so, so the board is clear, we did speak to, both Jack and I spoke to the regional manager, and the arrangement we made with him is that the parents would not be able to, the seventh grade parents, that is, not be able to purchase tickets through the organization that have to purchase them through us, so they would get the vouchers from us, and then whatever additional monies uh, were necessary for the cost of the trip. So that way we would be sure to uh, exhaust the vouchers that we had purchased, as opposed to parents saying, well, I don't want to buy the voucher from you. I want to go straight to the company. Great. Thank you, Dr. Best. Um, do board members have questions? I have some questions. I can go first, but if someone else wants to go, they are welcome to go first. Uh, Gina, go ahead. So the vouchers are going to be worth uh, $9.99 or whatever value that, that they are now. If there, there's an additional cost for the trip, those would be paid for. The additional cost would be borne by the parent, correct? Correct. And if there were, if there are 88 vouchers that we buy this year, if there are 95... Jack said it very well and that it would be our hope that this would go through. But there is a risk. Maybe it's not a very high risk, but there is some risk 
that we would not be able to do this. Gina raises a very interesting question about what if the number of people are different and say that we have 88 and there are 150. Next year, the trip, because very few people are traveling, is half the cost of what this year's trip is because airfares are low or hotel rates are low. How will you choose who has to pay the high rate and who has to pay the low rate? This isn't quite as easy as we make it out. It's um, and uh, you know this is not this was not a school sanctioned event. But if we buy the vouchers, we will have to put some rules I think associated with it. Um, some uh, we'll have to put some restrictions on this, and so we should be very much aware of that. Yeah, I just want to comment on Jim's point. Uh, good points. Um, so as far as the cost of the trip, in talking to the regional manager, more than likely the cost of the trip will be more than what it is now. He said you can figure on probably an uptick of some sort for next year's trip. So he did point that out to us. Um, so, but that doesn't mean to say your point's not well taken, that something could happen where they have to reduce the cost because they don't have enough people wanting to go on the trip. Or who knows, maybe the COVID, COVID comes back and that's a whole other set of issues. So I, I do want to be clear, there is risk here. Clearly, this is not a, a, free, a free situation where the board gets off scot-free. There is a certain amount of risk that comes into play. Uh, Jim also raises another important point that you have to consider, and that is if you buy the vouchers, then you own the trip. And by owning the trip, you take on liability for the trip. And so now you've got other things that you have to be concerned about, as opposed to when you say to the parents, it's your trip, you go ahead and you fund it, we'll just send off. We'll send the kids and we'll send a couple of our teachers. And it's no longer our issue. There's no headaches associated with that. This does bring in the issue of potential headaches. So there's no question about that. Uh, has anyone considered asking um, the families? I mean, is it all or nothing? Are some people willing to forego the cost and recognize that, you know, these things happen, you know. Um, yes, yes. Some people have already asked for a refund and gotten a partial refund. Some people have exercised their um, insurance claim. Uh, um, I think that's a very few in number, though. I want to say maybe three or four. So we're still talking around 85 or so parents that we're hoping to get uh, some sort of, um, you know, better, better situation than what they currently have in play. You know, that Dave brings up a good point, and, and your answer is good, too. I'm not saying that I, I, I really very much feel for these parents, and I do feel that, you know, we, we need to really work hard on this one. But what will happen if we say that we will buy the vouchers from the parents who haven't done anything yet, and then there are others who only got $250 out of it, and they want to come to us for the remainder, or they want to say this isn't really fair. How are we going to address that, I guess, is my question. Yeah, my knee-jerk reaction to that would be, uh, you chose to do that on your own. We were still trying to work out solutions. Uh, I made it very clear to the parents that we're looking at a number of vari a variety of solutions we're trying to pursue. Now, and, and I've had one person I kept talking to who then went back and talked to the whole group. So at least the group knew that I was still working on various uh, aspects of this, trying to find a better way to get a more significant portion of their investment back to them. Some people didn't want to wait that long. They chose to make the uh, uh, redemption on their ticket uh, as it was, whatever number of dollars they got back for that. Some have exercised their insurance policy already, which is fine, and they could still do that regardless of what the board does because they get a full refund on that. Um, so I don't think that would be an issue to, personally. Um, you know, this isn't the this isn't the um, policy of all travel companies. We had a trip planned for Spain, and we canceled. We get ninety five percent of the money back. Do we want to continue to do business with EF Tours if that's the way they're treating us? And yeah, we're, we're I think they have to speak to that. That's an excellent point, and the parents, many of the parents, brought that point up. So I mean, part part of their anger and their frustration was they couldn't believe that the company was going to be so steadfast and not budge one iota. I mean, right. I think it would have felt a little better if they said, well, all right, I'll tell you what, we'll give you 50% or 50% right. plus, you know, $100 or whatever. But they wouldn't budge, not one single iota. And that really irritated them. So, I mean, half of them was were, were feeling like, well, I just hope I know we're going to lose their money, and I get that, but I just hope the school district 
chooses not to do business with them anymore. And that's fine. We can do that, too. That's certainly an option. Um, and I understand where the company's coming from because Jack and I were talking about this. If the company were to give rebates to all of the people who are going on trips, we're talking national now. There's about, I don't know, 30, 40, 50,000 trips that are all going. They'd be bankrupt, I can guarantee you, absolutely bankrupt. So that's why they probably held fast to their particular position. Yeah, but Frank, other companies did give rebates. Other travel companies that do this. And I, I think we're getting into some really messy territory. And I would love to help these families out. But we're also obligating to continue to do business with EF Tours if we buy these vouchers. That, and no, that's no, I have a problem with that. Yeah, no argument. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. There's no it, argument it's about not that. not across the industry at all. They buy insurance for these sort of things. They're just maybe too cheap to buy their own insurance so that these th things didn't, you know, this is what happens to companies like that. Sorry. Yeah. And, you know, I, I feel very bad for the, for the people that, and, and by, yeah, I feel bad about it. But I think when we get into this, it gets messy. I understand. Uh, Gina, go ahead. So, as a school board, are we even allowed to get into this? This is taxpayer money that we're yeah, buying you, these vouchers. Yeah, you can. You certainly can. I mean, I can't. I don't have the authority to to do that. I, I, I probably, well, I wouldn't do it without consulting you and getting your support. Uh, but, yes, you can do that. You do have the authority to do that. And if this goes belly up, how do we explain this to the taxpayers? Uh, you're absolutely right. I mean, that's one of the risks that Jim and, and Dave brought up. You're absolutely right. There's no, there's no two ways around that. You're, you're stuck with a, with a tab of whatever number of dollars that is, uh, because of who knows whatever unforeseen circumstance, uh, you know, uh, put us in this position. Jack, is there anything from the insurance company on this that you talked to, Mary Beth? Um. When I talk with our insurance company, the big thing is, again, you go from this being not a school-sponsored event hosted by volunteers to now making this a school-sponsored event. Yeah. So you absorb the liability of it. Okay. Which would be covered. That's all I'm going to say. Yeah. And so, Jenny? Yes, go ahead, Tom. Th there are some other things, I think, that, that – come into play when it becomes a school sponsored event and that would be that um, every child gets the opportunity to go and I don't know how financially that would work out but once I think once you use the term school sponsored and once it is a school sponsored trip um, if a student with an IEP that requires a full-time aid or part-time aid decides to go that someone needs to supply that aid with them, I do believe. That's uh, correct. That's Bob is absolutely correct. Let me just jump in on that. So uh, any student who has diabetes and needs to have a nurse with them, then we would have to su supply the nurse to travel with the child. If it's an IEP-driven student and it had a one-on-one -on -one aid or any other consideration, those would have to also be addressed, and that would be the liability of the school district to provide that. So Tom is absolutely correct that you have to open it up to any student who wants to go who can afford to go. And if they have issues, then you have to provide the support necessary to cover those issues. So Tom, with that in mind, has anyone pursued the idea of keeping this out of the school district's hands, but still accomplishing the same thing by having, even if we as a district connect the dots between the folks who have the money invested right now and those people who may want to do it next year or the year after, yes. and they go ahead and do that themselves without yes. us. Yes, that, that was the original proposal was to have the seventh grade parents and the eighth grade parents get together. Uh, and so I had a letter already set to go to send out to the seventh grade parents, basically asking them to, I, I'm asking for your uh, consideration to, instead of purchasing a ticket from EF, yeah, purchase it from the eighth grade parents. Um, and so I, that's when the issue turned around. The, the parents 
weren't all that crazy about that. They were fearful that maybe a lot of the seventh grade parents wouldn't want to do that. And that's why the suggestion came up of us buying the tickets, um, the vouchers, so to speak. But, I mean, again, I, I think if that, that's the direction the board chooses to go, it certainly does provide still one more outlet for the parents in terms of being able to recoup more of the money than what they're going to get if they go straight back to the company. My, my observation is that why not, I, we don't want to do business with these guys. Why not be entrepreneurs and look at the competition, ask the competition, would they, if we were able to contract with them over a period of time under certain conditions, not us, but advise a group as such, and we'll be willing to use them for the following five years because it's a trip we've done for years, they might be willing to forego some of our losses to maintain that contract. Just ideas. Yeah, yeah, no, no, but no. I don't want to do business with these guys. These guys are renowned for this sort of stuff. Well, I didn't say that. I'm public. <laughs> I didn't yes, say that. I'll take that back. Dave, the problem with that would be is we cannot force future yeah. parents to do anything. Yes. yes. Um, okay, I'm not suggesting that. You're right. You're right. But we're not forcing them. We're just saying have have access to this, have access. Well, I think I think what the board's indicating to me so far, I mean, I'm kind of reading the tea leaves here, and I, I think all your points are well taken. Uh, I think the best thing for me to do is to go back to the parents and to say, and, and you got two choices here, really. One is to, um, you know, absorb it and basically say to the school district, I hope you don't do business with EF again, which we'd be glad to, to do, or... Uh, option number two, to work out some sort of system with the seventh grade parents and buy the vouchers and, and hopefully be able to talk them into buying the vouchers back from you. Again, there's a certain amount of risk that goes with that, too. So, um, Jack, maybe you can help me, but is there, a, is there a trust or a nonprofit that those parents could go to to maybe to be established to be able to carry this in the future that would not involve, you know, the board making a financial commitment that, you know, the taxpayers may not be comfortable with. Not that I'm aware. I'm not an expert in that. I just thought I'd try to throw something yeah. out to try to come up with a solution because I do, you know, my heart goes out to these parents. I, I do feel for their, uh, um, you know, where they are right now. Uh, but I'm also very concerned about the legal and the, all the other ramifications associated with the board being involved in this. I have to say I've been quiet, but I, I share the concerns that have been raised. I mean, I do think that there are some legal and liability issues. There are risks, and making a hasty decision at 10 o'clock at night sounds maybe unwise. That does not preclude our ability to continue to try to work in good faith with the parents to come up with a solution that is better, but maybe one that doesn't, um, you know, as, as Dave said, this was my first reaction too, you know, obligate us to continue to do business with this company, which which is concerning. It kind of puts us in a position between not doing business with them and, you know, suffering a financial loss, which doesn't seem like a good use of taxpayer money. So I do have concerns about it. No, and again, I appreciate, I appreciate the conversation. And I feel good that we've exhausted just about every possibility, and we've kind of talked through the various scenarios that one might uh, approach this with. Uh, and I, and that, I mean, that was my goal, to make sure that we kind of covered all the bases here and kind of reached every possibility that might be of benefit to the parents, because I think, as, as Tom and others have said, you know, I feel bad for the parents, I really do. And I think what the company did was patently unfair. There's no two ways about that. Um, and so that's why I was trying to find something that would be in a position to help them out. But again, I appreciate the conversation. I appreciate, you know, the insights. I, I think it's all been very fair and, and, and appropriate. And I think we've done the best we can. Give it the can I, can right. I throw out another option? Yes, yeah. Tina, go ahead. I have seen vouchers, not from this company, but for sale for face value on like eBay. For That's people who, you know, the wedding falls through at the last minute and yeah. they sell their honeymoon tickets or whatever. Good so point. Just, just a thought that people sell these vouchers all the time. Uh-huh. Um, yep, that's a great point. Thank you. Well, I wanted to say thank you, Dr. Best, for all of the time and energy you've put into this because I 
I think that by itself has been helpful. I mean, it doesn't make them whole, but we can't necessarily fully address the situation as much as we may want to. It is a terrible situation for the parents. No, I appreciate that. Thank you. Any other discussion on this? I am seeing none. I think we should move on to the proposed calendar. I don't have it in front of me. Um, so, Jack, can you help me out there? <laughs> And then we don't have a whole lot of uh, meetings coming up. But the only one I'm, I'm thinking of is the one in June. It's the first Monday in June for our board meeting, other than the uh, superintendent search committee meetings that you might have. Yep. So we've got, um, right now we've got the executive committee on the 18th of May. Okay. Um, we've got our monthly meeting on june 1st we've got graduation which we talked about earlier yeah on june 13th, 13th. and then we have an executive committee meeting on june 22nd and there may be some additional meetings oh, that's um, putting it up right now for us yeah thank yep. I, mean, I believe we've posted a non-public meeting relating to the superintendent search for this Wednesday, and Tom talked about that. So that's not on this calendar, but it is posted. Right. Yeah. And there may be some additional meetings. Um, again, as we talked about, um, we absolutely would have some some public meetings and conversations, but they're not scheduled yet um, associated with meeting the uh, candidates. Right. So one thing Lyra and I are going to want um, is a negotiations committee meeting, probably in May, because we are still uh, looking to move forward with the ed assistance. We already had one back on, I think, the 23rd of April, but we would like to schedule another one maybe next Monday night to give them an update on where we are. Uh, let, yeah, let me look at my calendar. Sure. I think it's a conflict. I don't have it in front of me, but I'll look at it tomorrow. Mo Monday or yep. Thursday, just keeping with that theme so that it's yeah. easiest for you. So if either one of those work, that'd be great. All right. Thank you so much. So I, I'm not available on next Monday, but I would be available on Thursday. Um, Th that may work. I just need to look. And then one other thing that we'll probably be looking at, which I'll have a further conversation with Tom, is a special board meeting on June 25th as it relates to the budget. Yep. Um, and I don't know if we want to have a finance committee before that. Um, you know, obviously with the remote learning in place and the school's not running, there's probably going to be a higher unreserved or unassigned fund balance at the end of the year. Mm. And I think I would like the board to take some action with that. I'll show you where I think it would have projected to be, where it came in at, and some of the rationale to do with some of the things I think we should do. Um, obviously, probably this various, various reports you're hearing with this CARES money, and uh, all I don't want to do is create an oscilloscope here uh, and the heart rate uh, for taxpayers by you know, making it go down and then it shoots high up. I'm right. trying to strike that balance, and I want, to, well, I want us to go through that process probably put money away and show you where I think we need to be in order to make the next leapfrog, which is October, um, to stabilize this uh, thing, because I'm very concerned with where um, the state may be with, uh, you know, various reports. We don't know much yet, um, but uh, those that were around for the 9, 10, 10, 11 budget, um, if you know, in 2022, we're, we're supposed to get an additional 900000 from the state. That was that one time, $130-some million that I highlighted in October. I'm just saying this. I'm just very concerned that the state might say, hey, you're getting all this federal money. We've had a significant downturn in revenue. We might not give you that. I'm just laying out various things. I ain't saying it's going to happen. It happened 10 years ago. 
but I, I just want to be prepared. I want to put the board in a position to be uh, choosing a number of different paths that it's comfortable with. Uh, I always like making decisions and having parachutes. Well, I think that would be great, and I think I'd leave it to your and Tom's discretion as to whether we want to have it as a finance committee um, or we have a full board meeting, but we definitely want to have one of those. It's a huge potential for huge challenges financially moving yeah. forward. We, we all know that. I mean, you can't live today and not be really, you know, questioning what's going to happen. Um, but I have a, a beginner's question. What do we do for graduation? I don't. Do we? Do we have a role in graduation? By the way, I don't really. Know. I mean, typically, the board members, any board member who wants to participate, participates along with the faculty, and it is absolutely a wonderful, wonderful experience. It's the culmination of of all of the years of the district's efforts, and so I think that's why we're excited about Dr. Bass's proposals, and we hope that they will be approved. Um, so that we can have some type of virtual experience. But yes, I mean, barring any COVID-related limitations, which I think it's hard to know exactly what they will be from our perspective at that point, um, board members are absolutely invited to participate. Great. As long as I can stay six feet away from Mr. Grodo, I'll be <laughs> Yeah, I'm hoping we can start having real life meetings again sometime. I still haven't read the governor's new order, so I don't know how that might apply. But, um. Uh oh, I have to get my cowl to the dry cleaners. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, only if we can do it safely. I mean, we've got to be we've got to be careful. But I, at some point, I hope we can start meeting in person again. So, Jenny, the one thing I would add is um, there's a potential for a capital facilities meeting in June, um, most likely to discuss uh, summer projects, uh, some summer required maintenance, and, um, and for us to review some of those things. We don't have a solid date yet, but I would just uh, let everybody know that we probably will have a, a committee meeting in June. Great. Thank you, Jim. Okay, anything else on the calendar? So TBD, once we have a little more information is the bottom line. Um, but most of these will be in June, not May, I think, other than the superintendent search piece. Okay, can we move on to public comment on any topic? Um, and again, let's follow the process whereby if someone is participating in the meeting, they would um, make a public comment. Um, looks like we've got one already, and then um, and then we'll just go through the phone numbers. So I see that Leah Willingham would like to make a public comment, and Leah, we would love to hear your comment. Go ahead. Hi. So I'm trying to turn my camera on. Uh, can you see me? I can hear you. I don't see you, but I think that uh, Jack is still controlling the. Uh, Calendar. The calendar. So I think oh, my noise. apologies. Hold oh, on yeah. a second. There you go. That's okay. All right. How about uh, now? So can you see so me? I see your little circle, but I don't see your picture. That, that's okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> sorry. Um, I'll, I'll try and make this as brief as possible because I know that it's late. Um, but given that I know we don't know when in-person meetings will start again, I... Um, just wanted to let you all know that um, this will be my last school board meeting. I'm leaving the monitor. Um, my last day is May 15th. Um, it's kind of a, a crazy time, but I got a new job. I'm going to be moving to Jackson, Mississippi to work for the Associated Press, um, which will be very different. <laughs> I'm covering the State House and a lot of um, COVID-19 um, down there. Mostly, I, I just wanted to let you all know because um, and and say thank you because um, I know all all of you looking down the list of everyone here uh, from school board members to district staff have spent a lot of time working with me. Um, you've been very helpful, patient, um, and I really appreciate it. 
it's been very rewarding and challenging um, to cover the school district in the city, but I've really enjoyed it and, and have felt um, that it's been really like an honor for me as someone who, who grew up in Concord and went through the school district to do that. So thank you um, for all of your time and again, all of your work. And um, it's been a really good experience for me. So. Well, Leah, thank you so much. And I'm so glad that you, that you spoke and um, I wanted to recognize all of the effort that you have put into this. And when you first showed up last summer, when we were having the policy discussions and just were there listening to that. And I think that you have done a great job and it's been really, really a pleasure to, to work with you. And we wish you the best of luck, but I'm speaking for myself, can't speak for anybody else, but, um, well, I'll but, speak. but just congratulations. Um, Cause I, I understand, I saw in the monitor, I guess last weekend that this is a report for America position. So yeah. congratulations and, and best of luck down there. Yeah, Jim, go ahead. I was just going to say congratulations, Leah, and uh, and best uh, best of luck. Um, I've always had such great integrity and uh, and uh, perseverance, and it'll, it'll serve you well. You'll you'll be very successful. Thank you very much. Thank you, Leah. Oh, Leah, it's Chuck. No, it's Chuck. I wish you the best. We've always had a good relationship. I thought, and I appreciate for your honesty and your candor, and I wish you the best. Thank you all so much. I really, again, appreciate that. And definitely hasn't been um, always easy, but I've been navigating this too, as all of you have been, and I've learned so much. I feel like I've grown, and um, you know, I have all of you to thank for part of that. So, um, thank you. Hey, Lee, don't forget uh, Mississippi. That's that's Faulkner territory. Yeah, it is. It is. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck. It's a northerner. You'll need it. I know. I, I, I really will. Um, it's going to be a very different experience. Um, very different. Uh, but I'm excited. I've, I've lived in New England my, my whole life. I grew up here. I went to school in Massachusetts. So it's going to be, it's going to, there's going to be a, a lot of chances to learn. And, and I'm excited for that part of it. So. <laughs> well, best of luck. We congratulations. congratulations and I'm sure that you will do a great job. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you, Leah. I don't see anyone else with a little chat function public comment. Jack, do you want to go see and if, there, if there's other public comments? Sure. Uh, I'll just go down the number again, 0029. I think that might be Liza. That's me. Okay, just confirm. 2488, any comment? Sure. Hi, everybody. This is Beth Richards. And first, Leah, I just want to say as a member of the uh, public, um, I appreciate all of your hard, hard work. And as you head to Jackson, Mississippi, if on a side note you want to connect with me, I have some colleagues in public health there. It's a beautiful community. Um, so, and have been there a little bit. So I wish you the best of luck. And if I can make any connections, I know relationships are important. So um, happy to do that on the side, but have appreciated your article. Um, and then quickly, just I have, as you know, I have followed the um, competency-based grading very closely. And I just wanted to add, I think it's wonderful that you, it is now going to be led through the students and really appreciate Dr. Bass's follow-up with me, and it's been wonderful. But just as an additional thought, as you move forward in a student-led process, um, there were some wonderful comments at the parent coffee that I was at with parents that were there transitioning students from the junior high school into the freshman year. So if you still have time and are able to reach into maybe some sophomore and freshmen, they may have really good perspectives because that was really eye-opening to me. So I just wanted to be sure to share that and then also to thank you for the time and consideration you were taking for the things that you were hearing from the community about this and letting the students guide that um, important next step. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Beth. Good night. Good night. All right, next one was 0020. 
Any comment? Is now exiting. Well, that's the number that was on our earlier, and there was anything from there. But 0020 again, one more time. And then that, Jenny, that's all I have. Okay. Thank you, Jack. Um, okay. Not seeing anyone else raising their hand and it being late, um, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. I make the motion we adjourn. <laughs> thank you, Chuck. Is there a second? I second it. Uh, I think that was Jim. Uh, was that Jim? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Jim. All right. All in favor, indicate by saying aye. 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 Okay. We are adjourned. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.